Bit of a break after Tussin. It won't win away. Uh, filled the batteries again and got back into the, the, uh, the zone for the final part of this season. This is the home of Canoe Slalom in 1992. It's where it made its reintroduction to the Olympic program during the Barcelona Olympics. Beautiful course. The paddlers love coming here. A lot of them spend most of the year here, in fact, and they enjoy it a lot. My name is Ross Solly. It is wonderful to be here. You can see the weather is perfect, 24 degrees. Feels a bit warmer than that, though, I can tell you. And uh, conditions absolutely spot on for what should be a wonderful afternoon of paddling. Joining me in the commentary box, I'm so excited to have this lady back. We've missed her. She's been away for way too long. Uh, Australian paddler, Ros Lawrence. Hello, welcome. Hi, Ros. Thanks. Pretty excited to be here. Yes, you've been away too long, so it is nice to have you. You've paddled on this course a few times uh, over the years. Yeah, many times. It's one of my favourites. It's in such a beautiful green setting and all the locals are so friendly. So, yeah, it's always a joy to come back to Sydney. It's a bit of a hike to get here, but I tell you, it is worth it because you uh, most people fly into Barcelona and then they do the hike up the mountains into the Pyrenees and uh, you come to this beautiful oasis in the middle of the Pyrenees and it's quite wonderful and this is a beautiful course. It has stood the test of time. It is, there's a lot of stuff that was here in 1992 that's still here and doing the job that it's meant to do. So we are bringing you this afternoon two semi-finals and two finals. It is the women's and men's canoe. And no real surprises in terms of the athletes who've made it through to the final. You see there that's the top ten uh, for the women's canoe. The very familiar name at the top of the list, of course, Jessica Fox. And uh, the men's semi-final will be coming your way as well. But um, a lot of nervous energy around because this is uh, Ros Lawrence, the final big international hit out for all these athletes before they go to London in a couple of weeks' time. And that's where it all comes to a head. That's World Championships. That's Olympic selection, Olympic qualification. There'll be a lot of athletes just hoping to get a few cobwebs out of the way this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people are on the start line today um, and this weekend trying to, you know, get everything together, make sure they're feeling good before they head to London. It's a pretty different course, um, but it's always good to get another start line. Yeah, what have you made so far? Of course, this is a new course for the uh, semifinals, different to the one that they used for the, the heat. So we're getting our first look at it here. But have you had a chance to cast your eye over it at all? Um, just quickly, as I was walking over to the commentating booth, it looks like there's some tricky staggers again, uh, as there was in the Quals course. But it looks like Lena's making a really good job of it so far. Yes, yeah, so this is Lena Tunison, the paddler from uh, the Netherlands. She had a good start to the season, but um, she's had a couple of tough runs here this week so far. Picked up a lot of 50s and got herself into all sorts of bother. Had to take two runs to get through to the semi-final, but here she is. And it's always difficult being one of the first ones on the course. Everyone's watching you, aren't they, Ros, and, and trying to work out where the tricky moves are and, and how to tackle. I mean, we, know, we do have the four runners, of course, but now we're actually seeing the athletes who are in this race and uh, everyone gets a bit of a, a look to see where the strong points are, where the weak points are. Yeah, absolutely. And we have this same double up here that was in the calls course, but you'll often find a lot of the later paddlers will be out watching the earlier runs to see how, how to do it. Pretty good so far, just the one touch up on gate four for Lena Tunis, and now she has a bit of a string of, of uh, downstream gates just to try and build up a bit of pace. That rock in the middle of the course is always a bit of a trick. Right? Yeah, and at this start tight stagger section, you'll see people often running a little bit late or you know, ducking off the poles, um, and there's a surprising amount of time to be gained or lost there. So, pretty good so far for Lena, good to set the a total early on and uh, oh there's a big touch there obviously um, of course there are 30 athletes who will take off in the semi-final for the women's c1 and the men's c1 just the top 10 will go through to this afternoon's final and we'll be bringing you that line as well so lana chuson puts down a 119.45 now it's uh, the turn of slovenia's alia kozarov Again, took two runs to get through to the semi-final. Sometimes that's a good thing, though, isn't it, Ros? Get a bit more practice on the water in a competition-type scenario. Yeah, absolutely, especially when there's a few similarities um, in the course between runs. That definitely helps. So, of course, this year we've been uh, trialling a new format with uh, Friday afternoon finals. It is uh, up to the local organisers. They can decide if they want K1 or C1 on the Friday afternoon and, and here in Spain. 
They've opted to have the men's and women's C1 on Friday afternoon. It's nice actually, and people come down from the uh, from the village, and you'll see this afternoon, I'm sure, for the finals, quite a good crowd down here watching. They, they love their canoe slalom here. It's got a real feel about it, this town, hasn't it? It's, it's got a real white water feel for it. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone in the town knows what the sport is. They know where the course is, and they come for a stroll. And likewise, you see the athletes in town having coffee or snacks or lunch. I saw a whole bunch of them up just, you know, an hour ago having a lunch break in town. Looking very relaxed, enjoying the warm weather. I'm sure I come here from, I've spent a couple of days in Paris this week at our canoe sprint um, Olympic test event, although we're not calling it a test event, but we were in Paris and it was quite cold and quite wet, so it's nice to come up here and get a bit of warm weather and get the shorts back out. Yeah, and to soak up some hot sunshine before yeah. heading to London, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Pozzarok, good run here. Just uh, She's got a review underway. So for those watching who've never seen this sport before, the green gates, you have to go through forwards. They're called downstream gates. The red gates that we've just seen there, uh, Pozzarok go through, they're your upstream gates. You have to go past them, turn around and come back through them. Uh, yeah, good time there. Five seconds faster than uh, the time set by Tunison. And they have, there are judges standing along the side of the course and they're watching to see if athletes touch the gate. If they touch the gate, it's a two-second penalty. Now, if they miss the gate, it's a 50-second penalty. So you really don't want to miss the gate. Um, Lucy Prio now from France, who you would expect to be knocking on the door for a top 10, certainly. She's uh, a pretty consistent sort of paddler. Just remind us, Ros, for those waiting at home, what you need to get through the gates to avoid a 50. Uh, you need to have your whole head and part of the boat going through the gate in one movement. Um, so you'll often see a little more in the K1, but sometimes in the C1, paddlers will neck the gate so the pole's really close to their chin, and that's when it may get a little bit hard for the judges knowing whether it's a 50-second penalty or not, but that really makes it more exciting, and it's kind of how paddlers will gain a lot of time. And the very, very good paddlers can do it very well, but they also give our judges heart palpitations because... Yeah, absolutely. And it's something for the course designers to take into consideration as well to make make it a bit easier for the judges. Um, and some of the best paddlers will often be really fast without necking the gates that tightly. So, yeah, there's often some different techniques out on display. And we do have, as well as the judges on the, on the side of the course, uh, we have... Uh, in Mission Control, we have a whole raft of judges who are watching the TV screens. We have cameras watching as many angles as possible of all the gates, so they'll go back and anything that looks contentious, any 50 call will be reviewed, so they'll go back and closely study the tape to make sure that the judges put the call right. Uh, they can overrule a judge or they can support the judge's call, so uh, that's what our team in Mission Control are up to. Uh, pouring over the vision as it comes in. Good run from Lucy. I think yeah. it's going to be a new fast time. So we've had that three really runs. Solid. Yeah. 113 clean. So that's pretty good. And she didn't really get into too much trouble. So No, she was very smooth. Uh, Lucy's been racing internationally for a long time now. Um, so I think that's definitely reflective of what she's capable of. Now, you may be surprised to see uh, Elena Lilik on the course so early, but she also had to take two runs to get through. She's had a great season in the C1. She's sitting second overall in the World Cup standings behind Jess Fox. Uh, she's had a bronze already this year. She had a gold uh, medal in Tussin, and she's come here straight from winning the Europeans. So she's had a very good season both in the C1 and the K1, her and Jess Fox sitting on top of both of those leaderboards. You would expect this rolls to be the time that will give us a good idea of, of what's a top 10 time on this course. Yeah, it's quite likely she'll set a very com competitive time. And Elena's pretty incredible the way she is so competitive in both the K1 and the C1. And that seems to be a trend these days. It has been a, for a while in the women's, but now in the men's as well. You see people like Yuri Pristovic doubling up. So, yeah, it's pretty impressive. But I know this race schedule could be quite exhausting, especially when you add in kayak cross as well. So these are really fit, strong athletes that you see successful, you know, in two or even three classes. Yeah, quite incredible. And, of course, with the way our system is with uh, qualification for the Olympics, a country can only have one athlete in each uh, category. And so for Elena Lilik, she's got a battle Ricarda Funk in the K1. 
and Andrea Herzog in the C1, both world champions. So Elena Lulik is in her own right a world champion as well. Uh, it's incredible, isn't it, that a country can have so much talent. And someone of those three is likely to miss out on going to London. Yeah, absolutely. And look, that was a solid run from Elena straight into first. So that's going to be the time that uh, she doesn't look that happy with it, though, I have to say. Uh, about a 112. So I guess, you know, if you're aiming around the 110 to guarantee that you're going to get through, then that's going to be a pretty good run. Monica Doria Villarubla. Now, she, this is her backyard. This is her backyard. She lives just up the road in Andorra. And uh, she spends a lot of time on this course. So you would expect she knows every drop of water, every rock. Yeah, absolutely. She trains here really consistently. I would expect great things from Monica on this course. She won a silver in um, Prague at the World Cup in Prague earlier this year. It was a great run and really was, I think, the moment that everybody sat up and took notice of what she's capable of. She's been consistent this year. I think she's only been at the two World Cups. I think she missed Tassa. So um, hasn't had the work schedule that a few of the other athletes have had, but she's been really strong paddler so up already on the split of Eleanor Lillick so Ooh. if you watch the way Monica paddles yeah there's a little touch, touch there, there. Yeah, she's also. always got the paddle in the water she's always got pressure on the blade and that really helps in a place like so because it's such a small tight course you kind of have to get every little bit of speed you can and really squeeze it out of the run you can see Monica switching there a lot of the athletes do that now don't they Ros they've been practicing and, and uh, in fact more do it than don't I think almost yeah, it seems um, most people switch now. The girls have been doing it for a long time, but even the guys are doing it a lot now. I know most of the Australian guys are switching, um, and I think it's really exciting, and people are usually they're good on the cross bow as well as the switch. It's just so there's so much to learn and so much to master, but it's pretty exciting to watch. Oh, she's quick. She's quick with her hands. Just really, really makes it look so easy. Here we go. We're going to have a new race leader, even with a touch. That is pretty good for Monica Doria Villarubla with a touch of 110. So a raw time of a 108, that's not bad. Yeah, pretty great. And exciting to see Noemi Fox out there on the water, uh, a fellow Aussie, so I'll try not to be biased, but nope. <laughs> so far so good. I always try and uh, put pressure on her to do well because I threaten her that if she doesn't make finals that she has to do commentary. So puts a bit of emphasis on her trying to get through to uh, the final so she can avoid sitting with me. <laughs> Sounds like great motivation, Ros. Uh, thank you, Ros. It does indeed, doesn't it? Uh, Nomi's had a couple of good World Cups, but a couple of disappointing runs as well. It's um, It's been a bit hit and miss for Nomi, so she'd be pretty keen to, to, to really nail this one before going to London. A lot of the Australians went back, of course, Ros. They don't normally go back. Uh, during the European summer to train, but this year a lot of them did go back. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a long season and this year there was the opportunity to have Whitewater at the Whitewater Stadium in Penrith. Yeah, so just tell us what's happened. What have they done there that's different? Um, there's new management now, so a new organisation that's running the Whitewater Stadium and we're still working out a little bit how that works, but it, yeah, it gave us the opportunity to have Whitewater in winter, which is a really great change. Um, sad to see some faces go from there, but yeah, it's good for the Aussies to be able to pop back, refresh, see friends and family, do work and uni if they need to, and mm. then come back to Europe. And I think a lot of the Europeans don't realise like how long Australians spend on the road, and you know, it, it really takes a lot of commitment. Um, but yeah, the Aussies are all they love being over here. See, Noemi is pretty familiar with his course. Like we've spent a lot of time over the years. Um, yeah, so it's something different this year. It's nice. I always find it amusing when the uh, Europeans complain about having to travel all the way from Prague, for example, to Liceo. Uh, and I think, well, that's just like a normal day trip in Australia, almost. <laughs> so coming down now to the line for Nomi Fox, she's going to be just outside. I don't know that that's going to be good enough for Nomi, unfortunately. We're sitting uh, with Monica Doria Villarubla's time at the top of the leaderboard at a 110. And so Nomi Fox at the moment sitting uh, clean, no, no, no errors for Nomi, but a 113 might be a bridge too far, but we'll soon see. Now, Fingers crossed. Yes. Now, Sonestan Oscar, who, um, well, it's been such a big year for her. She finished her, he finally finished her university studies. Um, and you know, that was a long course. And during that time, she was balancing her studies with, with paddling and 
never really got to see the best of, of Sonner, and now she finished in January, and wow, she went to the under-23 World Championships and blew people away. It was just quite, oh, I, I think there was a touch there. Um, absolutely blew it away. She was under-23 World Champion and did it in style, and she came out and did a pretty good run uh, in the K1 here, and uh, she's also got through to this stage the semis of the C1, so let's see if she can put it together but she's had two touches already so I think that's going to make it very and there's a third so yeah dear. she's got the speed um, but three touches does make it hard but yeah you're right she's been having such a great season this year um, so whatever happens today I'm sure she'll still be on fire for the rest of the year and it is hard isn't it Ros I mean th there are very few athletes in our sport who are just professional athletes and don't have to have a day job or do something outside of the sport to keep them busy and stuff like that. It is a balancing act, isn't it? Yeah, it's a balancing act and I think sometimes it's not about what you have to do. It's good to have something outside the sport, some study or a job, you know, a way to meet different people and have space away from the sport. Um, and often some of the best paddlers are really great at doing both things. Yeah, and, it, and they're not solely focused on their sport, which is a good thing. So costly there. Wow, without the three touches, uh, that would have been a pretty decent time. It would have given her a raw time of a, of a 108, which was around the same time as uh, Doria de la Rubla. So that's a very good raw time. But yes, yeah, three touches, it really does make it very difficult for Sona Stanoska. So we are now down to Victoria Dobrotoska from Ukraine. Hasn't had a great year, but uh, I think it's pretty understandable, Roz, when you think of what the Ukrainians have been dealing with this year. I think it's very hard for any of them to, to stay focused entirely on their sport, although, again, you were just talking about having distractions. Uh, there are good distractions and bad distractions, but uh, Victoria Dobrotoska hasn't had the greatest of years, so let's hope she can put together a run here. But it's just so good to see the Ukrainians here paddling. And, and yeah, it's really great, and I think been a lot of support from the community for them, um, changing where they live. And, you know, Victoria's a fighter. She will keep going for the whole run. Um, and she has a little daughter as well. I'm yes. not sure if she's here this weekend or not. But, yeah, she's got a, a lot to distract her from, you know, from paddling or maybe paddling distracts her from life. Who knows? It's always good to have a few different things. Yeah. I always, you know, I've spoken to both Victoria's, Victoria Dobrotoska and Victoria Oos quite a bit this year and they talk about just that that first thing in the morning when they get up and they turn on their, well they pick up their phone and they look at the news headlines and they're just hoping that there's going to be some good news there and most times it's not great news but uh, then they go out and train for a couple of hours, it's just you know, it makes you realise just how lucky we are. Yeah we are lucky. So just the one touch so far for Victoria, but a little bit slow. They're reviewing gate 17. Unfortunately, I think Vicky's not going to be in the hunt here. I think we've got to look at around a 110, Ros. Would that be a fair call to be anywhere in the mix? Uh, looks like it so far. That's the fastest time. So I'm not sure if anyone's going to go faster. Well, that, yeah, that's, sure. the, that's the fastest time with a touch. So I think some of our top end paddlers will be aiming at around 110 clean. Yeah, Definitely. absolutely. So, Dobrotoska there. Yeah, it's just uh, not the quickest of runs for her now. Elena Makosi from Italy, just 20 years of age. Been a few, seems to have been around for a long, long time, but you've got to remind yourself she's just 20 years of age. That the, uh, the Italians have a good, strong canoe team, and uh, they've been working together for a long time, working their way up through the juniors and under-23 ranks. And, of course, there's... For a lot of these teams, Ros, the battle isn't just to get the quota for your country, it's then the battle to get on your team because when you have two or three athletes all competing for the one spot, it's pretty tough. I mean, you've been there, Ros. You, you know firsthand what it's like. Yeah, absolutely, but that's the whole point. I mean, it wouldn't be sport without competition. The Italians do have a really great, strong group of C1 women. Um, and, yeah, they have been around for a while, even though they're so young, so... It's great that Italy's invested in them and they've been committed for all this time and you really see that the payoff is that you have tight competition for Olympic selection. I think it's well worthwhile. And, you know, if, every time you go out there on a training run or a, a mock race run at home, you're competing against some of the best paddlers in the world and it's got to work out for surely. Yeah, absolutely. 
So just the one touch so far, but um, five seconds, nearly six seconds off the pace for Elena Mercosi from Italy. We're about uh, nine. This is the ninth pattern. Oh, there's a big touch there. Unfortunately, we haven't had any 50s yet, which is nice. I suspect as we get on and people start taking risks, we might see some people trying to cut some corners. But at this stage, most of the athletes seem to be finding the course pretty pretty reasonable. Ross, there's a few touches here and there, but there doesn't seem to be anything too dramatic. No, and fingers crossed, I think. The, the strength in the C1 women field is really impressive. It's so exciting to see. And I was at the junior and the 23 world champs in Krakow recently, and I was blown away by the under 23s and the juniors as well. Like, there's so much depth and talent there. It's really exciting to see. What's it, what I found super impressive in Krakow at the juniors and under 23s is the number of athletes at that level who are also competing at a senior level. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot who are there. Uh, who are now competing here. Um, yeah, really talented, the youngsters. And I think also, especially in the C1 women, there's a lot of young paddlers who are very competitive at a senior level. So a nice run here from Marjorie Delasus from France. She's had uh, some early touches, though, which is... When you touch the gate early like that, Ros, you know, you touch gate one and then touch gate three, what sort of a mindset does that put? I suppose it's different for different paddlers, but what sort of mindset does that put you in as you head down the rest of the course? I think that, you know, the best paddlers just move on. They're delivering their race plan. They refocus and keep going like nothing has happened. Do that, um, does it mean, does it normally lead to people taking more risks, though? Because somewhere they've got to pick up that time. Yeah, it can, but I guess you make the fastest plan and you try and stick to it. Having said that, I have seen Jess Fox occasionally touch a gate and then absolutely lift her speed and blast everyone out of the water after yeah. that. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> could go either way. Nobody likes to see an angry fox. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, she can cut corners like nobody else. So, gee, what the heck? Where'd that come from? Yeah, she's a really strong <laughs> She's got four seconds in penalties and she's posted a 109. Marjorie De La Seuss, and there's a review, but even with that, she'll still be top top two. So there you go, folks. If you're wondering, that is a raw time of a 105 for Marjorie De La Seuss. That has set the new bar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the exciting part, I think, where we see people come in faster and faster. It's funny. I mean, I saw the two touches at the top, and I sort of ruled her out. I thought, OK, that's going to be tough. She's not going to to uh, be able to be in the mix here, but she posted really, really fast bottom half of the course. So on the paddle, on the award at the moment is Emanuela Luknarova from uh, Slovakia. Uh, went to Tokyo for the Olympics and did pretty well. So she'll be itching to, uh, to get out and put a good run down here and make a, make a final. Hasn't had the best of years this year, but um, Look, all of that means nothing when you get to London. That's uh, when, it, when it all matters. I should mention there's a lot of teams here, and I think Slovakia may well be one of them, Ros. This is part of their Olympic selection as well. I think even Australia, Lucien Delfour was telling me that uh, if you get fight, if you make uh, podiums here, it helps towards Australian selection. So there are a lot of teams who have already started their selection process for, for uh, uh, Paris, even though they haven't got the quota yet. Yeah, absolutely. So. London is where nations qualify their quota. Um, but, yeah, for example, Australia, this the World Cups form part of their pre-selection. And for the Slovaks, I think it's this race, London and Paris will count towards their Olympic selection for the Federation. Wow, Emanuela has nailed that up right at the drop. That was pretty awesome. She's really setting a good time here, too. She's going to be pretty close to uh, Marjorie Delasus's time. I think it's going to be... She'll be just over, but uh, well and truly in the mix there. Nice clean run there for Emanuela. No, she blows out a little bit down the bottom now, but um, she's looking a bit confused. Just lost a bit of speed at the top. Now, we've been waiting for to see the best of Teresa Fizzerova this year. It has not been her best year by her standards. Um, she was a regular on the podium the last couple of years, but this year in the C1, she's really just struggled to, to, to show her, her best. Ooh. Um, so is this where we're going to see Therese, the best of Teresa Fizzerova from the Czech Republic? She was one of the early 
when women's canoe came in, Ros, and I know you've competed against Theresa. She was one of the early leaders in the sport, wasn't she, alongside you know, the, the handful of, of Australians and others who were regularly doing it. But she was there at the start and um, was a regular on the, on the podiums. Yeah, I remember seeing Theresa kind of on the senior circuit in 2017, really strong, you know, making podiums. And she is a super strong paddler. Um, I wouldn't judge her ability by her year so far. I think she's capable of really sure. great things. And at the end of the year, everyone's hunting the Olympic selection, as you said. So. Well, she won a medal in Tokyo, so you cannot discount that. Uh, coming down now, she's had to touch on gate five, the big one we saw, but other than that, she's had a pretty smooth run, so she, she picked up some speed up in the middle of the course. Looks like she's around about the uh, Dallas Suze time. There is a review, though. The judges in the ground control are having a look at the tape. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm really impressed uh, to see how many cameras and angles there are on all of the gates. The amount of scrutiny that goes into making sure there are good judging decisions is pretty impressive. Yeah, and to be honest, it has to. I mean, this is these races can make or break an athlete. So you want as much technology at play as possible. You know, you don't want somebody's somebody's chance of making a final to be ruined by a, a, a contentious call you know you want to be able to examine it as closely as possible to make sure that there is no doubt i mean it is a tough thing isn't it ross some of those 50 calls it is a matter of judgment and you can guarantee there are some athletes who do push the envelope a lot and, and they will complain when they get to 50s but in the end the judges are going to make that call and having the cameras and all the extra angles hopefully eliminates a lot of that uh, confusion. Yeah, and look, in the end, the paddlers have to paddle in a way that doesn't leave an option for the judges to get yep. a 50. Um, Kim Wood's on the water now. What an exciting paddler. And if you're talking about people who have been around since the beginning of C1 Women, Kim Wood has been there since very close to the beginning and pushed by Mallory Franklin. And there's great young paddlers coming through from GB as well. It's so exciting to see them fighting it out on the water. Of course, trains at Lee Valley, and uh, we'll have a really big say in what happens in London, no doubt about that. She's had a good year this year. She's had two top ten finishes. Um, missed, didn't get, they didn't go to Tucson. Um, Kimberly and Mallory, they missed that event. So, well, Kimberly, I can't remember whether Mallory was there or not. But uh, Kimberly has had two top finishes, ten finishes. So she's had a good year, and her time's good this time too. She's nice and clean, and nice and fast. Yeah, looking very composed as well on the water which is always a good thing in Sayo. So now we're coming down to the last couple of gates. If she can hold this together, we could have a new race leader. Kimberly Woods from Great Britain was in the K1 in, uh, in Tokyo. But both her and Mallory, very competent at both the K1 and the C1. They've been doing it for a long, long time. And I think we are going to have a new race leader, Ros Lawrence. She's coming down now. It's going to be very close. I think she's oh, just out. Yeah, close, though. Just out. So That's still a great run. Yeah, I tell you what, it's uh, giving us a bit of an insight into Marjorie Jones de la Sousa's run, isn't it? Yeah. A 109 with two gate touches. And we have another great Italian martyr here. Um, and so you'll see what I mean when I say there's, you know, three great Italian C1 paddlers. It's really good to see. Marta was at the Junior Under 23 Worlds recently. Um, she's got a big season, but yeah, looking good so far. She just loves paddling and she's grown so much and she's taken on K1 now as well. Of course, she was a C1 paddler and now she's she's uh, taken on K1 as well and uh, seems to be enjoying it and, and having some good results as well. She went to Tokyo for the introduction for the first ever women's C1 at the uh, Olympics and has just grown since then and uh, the top half of this race very fast four seconds up so Della Seuss must have really nailed that bottom part of the course mm, yeah although that is when you look at that time don't forget that her two gate touches Marjorie Della Seuss's gate touches were gate one and gate three so that's why the time the first split time you'll see most of the athletes will probably be under that because of those two gate touches Matt is doing a great job of keeping the speed on the boat. Uh, always is moving, which is pretty important in Sayo. Um, the water's not as fast as some other courses, so you have to make sure you don't lose any speed anywhere. 
And still looking good, still clean for Marta Bernicelli from Italy, and the pace is still very good as well. She's coming down now in the last couple of gates and just holds it together. Tough little combination, this one, Ross. Yeah, it's a tricky move, and there's an option whether you do two spins, one spin, no spins. Um, in the C1, there'll usually be at least one spin. Ooh, we're going to be close here. She's going to be just outside, maybe third spot. Fourth spot for Marta Bernicelli. She's going to be on the cusp, I think. She's going to have a long, nervous wait now to see if she makes the final because we've got uh, a lot of very good athletes to go. Good representation from Team GB in this semi final. Three paddlers all making it through. Yeah, GB have been pretty heavily invested in C1 women right from the beginning, um, and they've got a lot of, lot of talented paddlers. It's great to see Sophie out here. She's still. Pretty young. Um, she's got great mo role models in Kim and Mallory to follow. So Sophie Ogilvy looking at. We've had now. We've had 14. We're halfway through. Halfway through the semi-final. We'll start to get an idea very very soon of who will be contesting the final later on this afternoon, and we will bring you that live. We're super excited because uh, we're seeing some fantastic racing on a fantastic course at a great venue here in the Pyrenees in the mountains of Spain. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty. It's a pretty fantastic setting. You can see the Cardi, the local mountain, in the background from the course. Um, there's beautiful green trees and grass everywhere. I always found it really relaxing to be racing in an environment like this. It's just got. A, it's a beautiful. If people watching, you've never been here. It's like a lot of Spanish small towns. It's got a beautiful cathedral. Have you been inside the cathedral here? Oh, I haven't. You what? <laughs> you got the might need to tick that one off while I'm here. Well, maybe tomorrow afternoon while they're setting up the course for the extreme, you can go and for the kayak cross, go and have a look at the cathedral. It is well worth a visit. Good tip. Thanks, Ross. Um, and you're welcome. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot to see in this town. It's a small, compact town, but the beautiful old part of the city is just wonderful. Oh, Sophie getting blown away a little bit there. Yeah, a little bit of trouble at the end of the course. So that unfortunately is going to cost her dearly. She was tracking pretty well up until then, but just getting pushed away towards the, at the, at the last gate. Now, let's talk about exciting youngsters. 18 years of age, Susanna Pankova, and just this year she's had uh, two finals. She's only been at two events. She missed uh, Tassin, I think. Uh, made finals at both her events that she went to. She's also uh, finished fifth at the European Championships. Just exciting. You've got to remind yourself, Ros, that she's only 18 years of age, but wow, what a future this girl has. Yeah, when she's paddling, it doesn't look like she's 18. She's got such a powerful and effective forward stroke. And that's always a really great help in a slalom race, um, but she's very composed and puts down really solid race runs. So that combination is pretty killer. And these young uh, Slovak paddlers, they've got the benefit at the moment. I, at the moment, I don't know whether you've seen Ros, but somebody you raced against a lot, Jana Dukatova, is uh, heavily involved now with the team and doing some media work with them. And, and she was in Krakow and uh, providing some guidance for these young paddlers. It's uh, a pretty good head to have um, focusing on your. Um, progression, isn't it? She's, she's such an experienced paddler. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jana Dukatova was a phenomenal paddler. I'm sure she still would be if she was still paddling, but what a great help to have on the team. I think, is she a physio now? She's doing some physio She does a lot of work. She was doing some media work in <laughs> Krakow. She's in the media centre here, but I think she does a lot of all sorts of work. She does do some physio as well, though, so I think she's the jack of Jill, of all, Jill of all trades. Good at everything. Yep. So Susanna's time is pretty good. She's had the one touch, but um, she's going to be again around that 112 mark, which is, I don't know if that's going to be fast enough. Unfortunately, she's going to be. Still going hard right to the end. Yep, yep, no, she won't make it, unfortunately. She's 10th at the moment, so only the top 10 go through. But uh, we, well, yeah. Now, Noria Villarubla, who is also, we talk about pioneers in women's canoe. Nuria was there from the start, wasn't she? And yeah, absolutely. And you've raced a lot against her, I know. Yes. She's a very gracious competitor as well, like so lovely and nice to chat with. 
Uh, she's a local here in Sayo, so she'll have the crowd behind her. And she would love, I'm sure, to get to, uh, get to the Olympics next year in Paris, but uh, let's see how she can go. She's already up again, I mentioned. I, I need to emphasize this, that uh, that first split is a bit hard to get a read on because Marjorie de la Sousse, who set that time, did have touches on gates one and gate three, so the split at the top will always be in favor of the pattern on the, on the course. Yeah, Marjorie's time is uh, standing the test against these competitors coming down later. But there's still a few big names to come. Yeah, we're not even we're not into the top ten yet, so there's a few paddlers to go. I can tell you, though, looking at it, I, I suspect that Eleanor Lillick is not going to make the final. I suspect Teresa Fizzarova will have some nervous moments, but I don't know that she will make the final either. So that's two big names at least who look like they're going to miss this afternoon's final. It's early days. We have a lot of paddlers still to go, but. Well, the great thing is there's uh, more big names than there are spots in the final. So I guess everyone can't be in there. Correct. Nuri is going hard. Fingers crossed. She's got a few tricky bits left and a bit of a sprint to the finish line. Ooh, that was nice. That was good control. So she's not going to be the fastest, but she could be top three. Yeah. Ooh, she slowed down a little bit there at the line. I don't know whether she misjudged where the finish line was. So... Yeah, again, a lot of athletes. A lot of, that's very crowded around that 112 time. Now, Evie Leapfast, she was good in Krakow, wasn't she? You and I saw her paddling there. It was, I think it was the best we've seen her paddle all season. Yeah, a couple of medals, no big deal. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was third in the C1 in uh, Krakow. And really uh, would have won gold except for, uh, I think, one, maybe two touches that... Uh, that put her out of the gold medal position but she was super fast she was super fast in the k1 yeah she pulls hard like that's what i really love about Evie's it's a really like, unique she, it's a unique style isn't she it? just goes for it like there's no no regrets in Evie's race runs so going well at the moment nice and clean for every leap fast she does spend a lot of time on the road she goes to most of the events and you'll see her parents alongside her, her support team. It's really great to see them with her. It can be pretty lonely on the road, but, you know, she's got some great support behind her. Ooh. So there is a pretty big two-second penalty there for Evie Leifarth. But we have seen that uh, well, the fastest time on the course at the moment includes two touches, so you can get away with it if you're fast enough. One touch can still not rule you out of making it through to the next round, but uh, you do have to try and get the rest of the course right. Yeah, she's still going pretty well at the bottom here. Like, she did that upright really nice. That was a quick spin. These spins are pretty tricky. Um, and if there's anyone that can absorb a touch in their time, it's Evie. A little, mm, low. a little bit low there. So she's going to be fast, though. She's going to be around that 112 again. So many people just cluttered around that. 112 sitting there in six. That is that is a real traffic jam there. Yeah. yeah, I mean there's five people on 111 at the moment, so it's pretty tight. Uh, yeah, five. Uh, yeah, that's, that is so tight around there. So now another who did very very well at the oh, and there's a touch early for Teresa Neblova. Another who did very well in Krakow at the uh, at the juniors and under 23. She was second in the final. And, um, behind Sonis Danoska. It was an unbelievable final, I have to say. Do you remember it, Ros? Um, everyone who crossed the line thought they'd won because the, everyone just kept laying down these perfect runs. Yeah, it was pretty exciting to watch. Therese Neblova, I'm sure, thought she had the gold medal in her hand when Sonis Danoska came out and just put down a run which you would not believe. Um, Therese Neblova, I think, could not believe that she'd been beaten. She'd put down that good a run. So she's in good form. She brings that form here to uh, Sayo, and she's had that early touch, but... Ooh, oh, there's another, another one, there. I think, yeah. Do you know what I found out coaching in Krakow? That I'm not very good at spotting touches. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, I, I, I remember when you were paddling, Ros, and you weren't very good at spotting touches because you used to always argue. <laughs> <laughs> but that's our athlete's prerogative, it's isn't it? It's all part of the job. Exactly. Right. Um, I get confused sometimes because uh, there is, for people watching home, there is what you call a, a water touch or a space touch because sometimes if the water splashes up and hits the pole, that's not a touch. But that's the tricky thing for the judges to find out, isn't it? What's a water touch and what's actually a touch? Yeah, and it all happens so quickly. It sure does. Ooh, there's another touch. So, unfortunately for Teresa, it's not going to plan, and I don't think she's going to, or she won't see finals actually, unfortunately. Just too many touches and a couple of problems there for her. So, Teresa Nebelova's afternoon is over, but all her experience, she knows she doesn't even have the time. That did not go to plan. Vicky Wolfhart, what an exciting paddler. Both classes. Um, she's been doing both classes for quite a while now. Really aggressive style, but still smooth at the same time. Yeah, fantastic to see her uh, doing the C1 and doing well at it too. Being able to combine both. Always think we. Uh, we never, we never get to or rarely get to see the very, very best of Victoria Wolf after. She always is thereabouts, but just, we're just waiting to see the day when she just nails that perfect run. It's going to be something which is well worth seeing, I think. Maybe, maybe today's the day. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the run. Because uh, it's been a nice, clean start, which is important. Of course, uh, Victoria and the Austrians spent a lot of time training at Tussin. Wasn't it sad? I mean, I know you used to love Tussin. Uh, Ros, it was so sad, and, and our hearts went out to the, the, the uh, Slovenian paddling community with the floods they had through there and the desperation with the, the course that got washed away and they lost so much during those floods. It was heartbreaking to see. Yeah, the, footage, the video footage is pretty incredible. If you get a chance to have a look, it's out there on social media. But yeah, I mean, Tussin floods nearly every year, but this was like this nothing was... I've seen before. It was so high. This, ooh, 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 ooh. A bit of whiplash there. Yep. This was, uh, yeah, it was heartbreak, but we know how res resilient the, uh, the Slovenian paddling community is, and I'm sure that they will be back on their feet very soon. And the good news for them is they do, they've got other venues, yep. maybe not venues of choice, but still really lovely ones to paddle on or do the training. Good touch there. Oh, she's got, she got a 50 for that. Ooh. It was tight, wasn't it? Maybe the first 50, but I don't think she's... We're going to see that in a moment. We can see in her face whether she thinks that's fair. No, shrug of the shoulders, I'm sure. That Here we go. Might not be any even without the 50. Oh, hard to say for sure from this angle. Yeah. Well, the judges will pour over the footage and decide whether that's a 50 or not for Victoria oh, Wolfe. Oh, Gabby Sackova, that's... Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, that's so shallow there. Oh, my goodness. That's unfortunate for this young paddler. She's such an exciting young paddler. Third in Prague earlier this year. She was fourth in the Europeans, but, oh, my goodness, she's... Well, she managed to... Uh... Oh, she got two seconds. Okay, seven. I mean, yeah, it's really important to reset and keep going after something like that. You never know what's going to happen. I saw you and Chris Kibbutz do a little reset this morning. You still made it He's through. Still made it through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you and Chris Kibbutz, boy. Um, now, we're going to start seeing uh, who's going to make the final now. So at the moment, Marjorie Jalasus is the one waiting to see. And I think judging by the time here, she's about to have a cue come up alongside her name, which means she has qualified for the final. Which would be pretty exciting for her and just rewards for what was an exceptional run with two gate touches to be still sitting on top of the leaderboard. But Gabby Satkova fighting it out to the end. Yeah, she's pretty aggressive on those staggers there, trying to get as much time as she can. I'm not sure what the Czech um, uh, Olympic qualification is, whether this is in a, a race for the Czechs as well, but of course the women's C1 is a hotly contested event for the Czech paddlers, so uh, not sure whether this goes into the mix or not. But, uh, mm. The Czechs are pretty strong in all the classes, to be fair. Yes. Gabby okay. having trouble just keeping her boat afloat, really. Going over a couple of times, but 
no good, unfortunately, for Gabby Satkova, but good news for Marjorie Delasus. She is into the final. Look at this here. This is where... It... Just after this, just getting on the, the, the lip a little bit and pushing her over. Gabby Satkova. Yeah, Gabby's such a, such a strong paddler. I'm sure we'll see great things from her in the future. Another local paddler. Yes, uh, Miriam Lescano has a very good uh, run in the heats, as you would expect on a uh, course that I'm sure she spends a lot of time on. She'll have a good fan base out here this afternoon. If she makes it through to the final, they'll, they'll all be coming down to, to cheer her oh, on. Oh, absolutely. The Spanish crowd here is so supportive, so I'm always really happy to see Spanish in the final because it just makes it that much more exciting. And, of course, with the, uh, the weird hours of the Spanish keep, which involve <laughs> sitting up till about 1 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and then I, getting up a little later. Uh, I did the drive last night from Barcelona up to uh, up to here, to Luceno, and drove through a couple of the small Spanish towns on the way up. It was quite late at night. It was after 10 o'clock at night. And they were all humming. All yeah. the towns. Kids, kids, kids out running, running around. around. It's pretty different to Australia, It's right? sure is. Yeah. In Australia, if you're, <laughs> totally up, normal over here. if you're up after 10 o'clock and you're a kid, you're in big trouble. <laughs> but uh, that is the Spanish way, and it seems to work for them, so... Good on, uh, good on them. Marin putting together a nice run here. So she's looking to it. Kimberly Woods at the moment, who is looking anxiously on. Uh, Kimberly's time is a 109.77. So Marin looking to go under that. I don't think she's going to go under Kimberly Woods' time, but is she going to put herself in the mix? She's going to be around that 111. Yeah, game. she's going to be in that 111 mix with five other people. So I think there'll be a six, few people. Six in, people obviously. now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six people. How good is it to see this young lady back yeah, and paddling? Yeah, and what a great qualifying run in C1. First time this season in an international competition goes out and lays down a, a qualifying run like that. Yeah, so Kate's a really strong paddler. She's strong in a lot of sports, uh, rock climbing included. She trains in Canberra yes. now uh, rather than Penrith. Oh, always another touch. She my, had a lot of... My former hometown. Yeah, a lot of cold, dark, early mornings mm -hmm. training before work. She's a physio now. Um, and, yeah, great to see her over here getting some sunshine finally. It's not all cold in Canberra, you know. It is actually quite warm sometimes. Mm, I think if you get up and train before work, it's nearly always cold. I used to do breakfast radio in Canberra. I'd get up at quarter past three in the morning and it was always minus five. Ouch. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Oh, another touch there for Kate, so... Oh yeah, three touches is going to make it very difficult for Kate, but uh, who's on the cusp now? Monica Doria Villarubla is on the cusp with a 110. So Kimberly Woods is through. Um, so, so far we have Marjorie De La Sousa and Kimberly Woods into the final. And unfortunately, I think for Kate, it's going to be a bridge too far for today, but just great to her, for her to see her back paddling with Miss Two this season. Yeah. They, she'll be staying over for London, I assume. I assume that's the plan. Yep. Um, yeah, I think a couple of days off. You, you can call it off and then, yeah, heading to London with the rest of the team. Yep. So, Katie Eckhart, who's been a regular on the team for a few years now, so good to see her back paddling and giving this a bit, a bit of a red-hot go. But unfortunately, will be no finals action for... Kate, but it does mean that uh, Monica Doria Villarubla, in front of her home fans, just up the road in Andorra, will be very excited to see her in the final later on this afternoon. So, Katie Ekadez, a 1.22, three touches there for Kate, which uh, is never going to be fast enough. Another local here, Clara Olafarbel, who is still uh, 25. Well, I remember when she started off as a teenager, she was so fast uh, as a young paddler and just... She's tiny, uh, but gee, she packs a punch, doesn't she, Rose? Yeah, absolutely. We used to call paddlers like Clara a uh, pocket rocket. Well, you were a pocket rocket there for a while. You, were, you used to go and smash courses and people used to see you get out of the boat and they'd go, oh, she's so tiny. <laughs> yeah, we, we see all sorts of body shapes and sizes in canoe slalom. It's one of the cool things about sport, I yep. think, that... Um, when you see Yuri Priskovic, uh, for example, he is, no, he is the pocket rocket, mm -hmm. this guy. A very strong pocket rocket. So, yeah, so. Ooh, a little bit of uh, fender work there for Clara. So on the cusp at the moment, it is Marta Bertoncelli now who's waiting 
to see whether she will be in the final. Her time, and she's the first of the six on the, in the 111. Oh, Clara. That's interesting. Some of these eddies, they're a little bit narrow. It's quite easy to run into the sides, to be fair. Yeah, so where are you seeing, Ros? Where's the difficult part of this course? Where are people really struggling? And where can people make up time? Have you, have you got a, a handle on that yet? Uh, yeah, I guess in some of these staggers are pretty tight, so you'll see some people can keep the boat moving the whole way through. They're constantly putting pressure on the blade, and others are sort of ducking off, and the boat's kind of pulling off a little bit to the side, so that makes a big difference. This section of these left three gates down the bottom as well. Um, we see a few mistakes popping up. And this is where, isn't it, Roz? This is where your arms are aching, your legs are aching, especially in the canoe. It's just everything's starting to hurt. Yeah, depending maybe how hard you've been training in your fitness sessions. But yeah, I think so is pretty famous for making the arms hurt and you can pull hard the whole way down. So Clara joins the 111 Club. It is an exclusive club. Oh my club. goodness. There are so many <laughs> athletes in the 111 Club. That's crazy. Moment. Marta Berrincelli, though, is through to the final. She'll be super excited. Now, speaking of athletes that we're waiting to see the best of, Andrea Herzog, uh, world champion, has not had the best of years by her own standards. I know she was she was a bit sick there for a little while, but I saw her at breakfast this morning. She was having a good hearty breakfast, so I'm assuming she's feeling pretty good about life at the moment. We know what she's capable of. So she nails it all. Absolutely. She's so, so strong and she just pulls these super fast runs out every now and then. And a little more often than every now and then. Yes. <laughs> and one of only a handful of athletes, Ros, in the women's who just concentrates on the one discipline. So many do both K1 and C1. Andrea just focuses on the C1. That's all she focuses on and uh, it seems to work for her. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say it's not too late, though. She could still do the cable as well. Yeah. Pretty crowded, pretty crowded field in there for Germany. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yes, looking good at the moment. Nice and fast here for Andrea Herzog. It'll be a very strong final if she can make it through. She will really make a few of the, uh, the, the athletes sit up and take notice. So far, so good, girls. She's nice run. really out that stagger. It's pretty impressive. So we're waiting, Teresa Fizzarova is waiting to see, and Teresa Fizzarova also in the 111 category. So one anything, of the many. One of the many, it's a growing list. But, uh, at this stage, the way that uh, Andrea's paddling, she's going to be around the 110, so this is going to be a good time for Andrea Herzog. She's going to be through, in fact, she, she may be the new leader. In fact, she is, wow. wow. She just, she gets such great acceleration. She pulls so hard out of the upstreams. Well, we've been waiting for that. We've been waiting to see Andrea Herzog nail a good run this year, and that was it. So well done, Andrea Herzog. She is straight into the final. Victoria Oos now. And she is having a good season. Right? Sure is. <laughs> really, really is. Second in Tussin. Um, just been consistent all season in the C1 and the K1. Based uh, in Poe now, I think? Yep, I think that's right. Um, Still got uh, most of her family in uh, the Ukraine, of course, which makes life very nervous for her. But if anything, she seems to be an athlete who her situation at home, her situation in her home country has inspired her to work harder, I think. And, and interesting talking to some of the Ukrainian athletes now. They feel like, I was talking to one or two of their para canoe athletes this week, they feel like they want to do something to give the Ukrainians something to cheer about something to be excited and happy about and if it can be on the sporting field well that's their contribution to to what's happening to lift the morale yeah that's of, a really great name it really is and victoria's really taken that approach this year and, and just really put together some fantastic runs so you see in game 13 now she's gone from the punt straight to the switch which is pretty pretty awesome technique she's just so good at keeping her fl boat flat all the time and running the speed except on that rock there. Yes, well, <laughs> she sort of used the rock to straighten herself up a little bit, but... Uh, I've been near that rock many, many times. Have you? <laughs> yeah. Just sneak up on you a little bit, I think. So, she's not going too bad. Again, it's still uh, Teresa Fizzarova who's waiting to see if, at her time, Teresa Fizzarova's time is a 111.3. Oh, that is... She's solid at the bottom there. Yep, she's going to be in. She's going to get through. Yeah, really good. She's through as well. Second. Second. She's pretty happy about that yeah. too. Yeah. Good on you, Victoria. It was another final for her this year, just continuing 
what's been a great season. Mallory Franklin, what a phenomenal paddler. Yeah. And great taste in boat design as well, I must say. It is nice, isn't it? It's good to see. I don't know, why do more athletes do that? Uh, I think sometimes it kind of makes it a bit longer, a little bit time on the boat, so... Yeah, but I don't know. I think everyone orders in a bit of a hurry and they don't have time to think about the design. Well, it certainly stands out. And uh, Mallory, of course, silver medalist at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Such a tall, she's such a tall athlete. She's Mallory. definitely got the, the levers to make that boat move. Yep, she really, really has. So uh, good to see her working hard and great to see her back. She's had a bit of a staggered season this season. But uh, she was third at the European Championships. I think that's her best result of the year so far in the C1. But we know what she's capable of. I think she's a former world champion. I think she won world championship in Po. Yeah, memory, so I think she got a silver medal in Rio yep. as well. Yeah. Uh, I think Mallory's pretty good at building through her season and saving it for the big one. So the nervous wait for Teresa Fizarova continues. She's had a couple of athletes now who have gone through ahead of her, so she's still waiting. And Mallory tracking really well here. This is this has been a very smooth run. Looks good at this stage, no penalties. And look at that split, she is going really well. This is a nice time. Yeah, pretty impressive. I should point out when I said a silver medal in Rio, I meant the Rio World Championship. Yes, not, not the, of course, C1 was in the Olympics in Rio. Much to our disappointment, Ross. <laughs> it's all okay now. Yeah. And Mallory is going to come down, she's going to be our new race leader, I think. Yeah, wow, that's impressive. Wow, what a good run. Number one, Mallory Franklin. Congratulations to you. It's tight, though. It sure is. Wow. Two Brits in the final already with Kimberly and Mallory. Now, Angel Hooger, another of our young paddlers, 23 years of age, picked up a, uh, a silver medal in Augsburg early this year, I think, behind Jess Fox. And she was ninth in Prague. So she's had a couple of good C1 finals or good C1 competitions this year. Just a young paddler, got her eyes obviously on representing France in front of their home crowd next year. Talk about pressure amongst the French team, Rose. Goodness me, men's and women's. Uh, yeah, it's amazing every year, you know, you might see someone different on the French team who's a world champion or an Olympic medalist. They've got so many. Um, yes. It's pretty exciting. Well, it's a bit of a luxury when you can keep an Olympic champion out of your team. Which is what's happened with the uh, French in the men's C1, but uh, we can talk about it later maybe. But Angel Hook is an exciting paddler and super fast. She was super fast in the heats again. Teresa Fizarova still. Oh, Angel, that's going to be costly. Just got blown away a little bit there on uh, gate 13. Stopper between the ups is a bit of a classic. It's quite specific um, and it does kind of try and shove you down a bit low in the eddy. So important for Angel now not to lose focus. Oh, there's a touch there, I think, for Angel. So uh, it hasn't gone her way in the bottom half of the course, unfortunately. You can see the French fans there, the French team giving support on the bank. But unfortunately for Angel, I think it's not going to be good enough for the finals, which means that Teresa Fizarova will be the eighth paddler into the final. We've got two more paddlers to come. They're not bad paddlers, by the way. Um, but Angel Hook is out. She'll be disappointed for sure. But she lives to fight for another day. Now, Claudia Zwolinska from Poland has laid down this year some of the fastest raw times in both C1 and K1 of any athlete on the water. But quite often those raw fast times have a couple of touches with them and that has crawled her middle prospects this year on more than a couple of occasions. Can she put it together and lay down a run today without penalties? She was second at the European Games in front of her home fans in Krakow. She's just a super improved performer, Ros. Yeah, I mean, Claudia's been around for a few years. She's been doing C1 for quite a while now, and it's really impressive how good she is at both classes. Um, I really hope she can put down a fast, fast time without touches. Um, they say sometimes it's easier to make yourself clean 
once you're fast uh, than the other way around. Yeah, makes sense. It does make sense. So sitting on the cusp at the moment, Fizzer Rover is in. So Clara Oliver, will the Spanish paddler, is the one watching on now, chewing her fingernail. She is a 111.32, which is what... Uh, ooh, what do you think of that, Ros? Oh, I think it was all right. All right, you should be a judge. <laughs> the athletes would love you to be a judge. Um, so 111.32 is... And, oh, she's up on the split, so she's really putting together a good run here, as we would expect now. She just needs to stay out of trouble and try and avoid these touches because we know what she's capable of if she can hold it together. At the moment, Andrea Herzog at the top of the leaderboard with a 108. And she's pretty smooth at the bottom here. Yeah, she's going to be OK, I think. She's going to be through. It's not going to be the quickest, but she's definitely into the final. She'll be pretty happy. Look at that smile. That is a smile of an athlete who's done the job. Now, is this lady any good? Well... <laughs> You can ask anybody in the world that question and the answer yes, yep. wholeheartedly. Especially in the C1, where she, and without wanting to embarrass my co-commentator, Jess Fox and Ros Lawrence were two of the early foot soldiers when it came to recognition for women's canoe sport. And the amount of time and effort you and Jess put into doing that, Ros, was I know it took a big toll on you uh, on and off the water because it was a long, hard fight. Um, but I hope you feel some satisfaction, Ros, with what you're seeing now and the strength and the justification now that women's canoe really should have been here a lot, a long time ago. But just the strength of the sport must give you a warm, fuzzy feeling for all that effort you put in, you and Jess and others. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it makes me really happy to see how fast these C1 women are. And Jess in particular, you know, she's always exciting to watch and often competitive with the men. So she really kind of drives the point home that we would see one belongs and is here to stay. I don't think there's anyone out there who can argue that it doesn't belong. And certainly every time we have a competition, it's just getting better and better. So Jess Fox, she's had two wins this season already. She's also had a tenth, so she hasn't missed the final. Always looks in these rate in these semi-finals, etc. that she's just keeping a little bit in reserve, doesn't want to take too many risks, wants to make sure she gets through to the final. But even then, she's still more than two seconds up. So Jessica Fox is uh, sitting pretty at the moment. Sitting in 10th spot is Clara Olafar. I would not like to be an athlete sitting there hoping that Jess Fox is going to stuff up, especially in the C1, because that doesn't happen very often. Mm, and she has, she has the speed to absorb a couple of mistakes as well. Oh, look at this time. This is a new race leading time. That is pretty impressive for Jess Fox. Absolutely. And she knows how to lift in the final as well. I've no doubt we'll see even more from her. Yep. Got a rat, rat bag Australians there just getting in the way of the camera. So well done, Jess Fox. Jess Fox is through. Doesn't look that excited about it, but... Uh, no point getting excited in the semi-final, I suppose. I think when you've got that many race runs in one weekend, you've got to keep your composure. Yep, for sure. So, oh, she's got a new signature. Is that a new signature on the back of the helmet? I haven't seen that before. Like it a lot. <laughs> um, so let's look at this top ten, Ross. Uh, Jess Fox through number one uh, with a 107.3. Andrea Herzog there second, sitting second. Victoria Oos. Marjorie Della Seuss with the quickest raw time. Yeah, wow, that's pretty impressive. Two touches and still fourth ranked. She was super fast yep. out there. Claudia Zwalinska as well was pretty fast with a touch. Kimberly Woods, Mallory Franklin, Monica Dory of Villa Rubla, Marta Berticelli, Teresa Fizzero. That's a pretty good top ten, isn't it? Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm excited for the final. A little bit disappointed for Spain. They've got some near misses there. Um, but lots of great paddlers in that top ten. Yeah, no Spanish in the final, which uh, for C1, that probably is a little bit of a surprise. There is an Andorra, no, in Spanish, close to Spanish. They're good friends, I think. You can't call me, that's like calling me New Zealand or Australian, which we do, by the way. For people watching, we are in Australia, we're very happy, Russell Crowe, for example, to claim New Zealanders as Australians. <laughs> uh, so also maybe. Pavlova, yes. Australian. Yes, oh, don't get started on that. Um, so I'm not sure whether the Spanish claim Andorans is their own, but uh, there will be Andorran in the final. So that was a crackerjack semi-final, as you would expect. And I'm just looking here at the people who just missed out, Roz. Um, it's right in the middle of that 111. We've got two 111s in, and then 
five more that have missed out. That's tight. So Teresa Fizzarova was in 10th position with a 111.30. Clara Olafarbo, 111.32. So 0 0.02 of a second outside of the top 10. Yeah, and then... Evie Leepha, 0.2 of a second slower again. All the way down to 15th place, still 111. Wow, Helen and there sitting in 111.98, so it will be interesting, yeah, interesting to have uh, a couple of those names missing from the final, including uh, Ellen and Lilik missing from the final, but gee, that is a quality, and, and we're seeing, we've seen Andrea Herzog, Marjorie Delos, Marjorie Delasus, a couple of the athletes who we've waited this season to see their very, very best, and they've put it together today. Teresa Fizzarova as well. Three athletes there who we probably haven't seen the best of this season, and now business end of the season, Ros Lawrence, they are starting to uh, show what they're made of. So, it's going to make it for a great final. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be pretty, pretty tight in the final as well. I think a few. A few will go faster, hopefully no blowouts, but I think it's going to be exciting. So will most of these athletes now, uh, there's Jess talking to her coach, and also known as her mum. What's she pointing out there, do you think? What's she saying? Ros? Mm. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> what was that? I don't know. Was that disappointment with the, so with the way she took a gate, do you think? Detailed or? analysis of the course, I think. Yeah, she does... Uh, she doesn't. She does get some. She does get demonstrative sometimes. Uh, Jess gets it from her mum, I think. Her dad doesn't get too demonstrative. He's just he's just you know, laid back, brick come Aussie sort of bloke. But uh, there must be some pretty robust conversations around the dinner table. I'm sure. I am sure. So now let's look at the uh, at the men's uh, C1. And wide open. I think this is a really wide open race. A couple of the big names missing from here. Uh, Sidera Stasiades is missing. Giovanni De Janeiro is missing. Uh, so uh, a few paddlers missing, um, Ros, that, um, but it's still, look at that. Look at that. Benjamin Savzek, Luca, Luca Bozic, uh, Mate Benush. Adam Burgess, it's a pretty quality field still. Yeah, absolutely. Some some big names there that have been around for quite a while and they know how to put down a good a good race time. Sorry, did I say Giovanni? Mm -hmm. I did, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, of course Giovanni's missing from this because he's a K1 peddler. Um, but, uh, yeah, Sedaris is not here, though, which I'm not sure why. Maybe he's just taking a break. Yeah, I, I don't have the inside info on that. Sorry, Russ. Do you think people are confused because you're Ross and I'm Ros? I would hope they can tell the difference listening at home. <laughs> Sometimes people call me Ross. Do they? <laughs> Sometimes they're really angry. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> Sometimes they call me Ros, and I like that. <laughs> I don't mind that at all. And we have Oliver here from New Zealand. He's an up-and-coming young paddler. Paddler, pretty exciting. The Kiwis are doing doing well. I think they're making progress each year. It's exciting to see our neighbours from across the ditch. Yep. Good ones are ours, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we haven't seen a lot of Oliver this year, so uh, good to see him in a semi final here of the men's canoe. Yeah, paddling pretty well so far. Nice start here. I think the men would have all been watching the women's semi final. Yeah, seeing how it's done, yep. where to switch. And we saw the fastest time for the women, the fastest raw time was set by Marjorie de la Seuss. It was a 105.3. So definitely the men would all be looking at going in the, in the mid to low 90s, wouldn't they? Ros, you, is that the line you draw through that? Look, I have no idea. I usually just wait till someone crosses the finish would, line. Do, would you normally expect the best men's time would be around, well, Jess excluded, would be around 10 seconds quicker? Is that a... Is that a yeah, something like that, I think be thinking of it as a percentage yep. um, for the women are 100 the fastest women roughly 107 percent yep. behind the men yep. when they're fast yep. Yep. not always certainly they're going to have to go oh oh dear oh dear what's happened there he's in a tough spot there he's back to, he's back the truck in and he's got wedged between two small cars uh, between the gate and the rock and now it's unfortunately fallen apart a little bit for oliver pushner from New Zealand, you could sense his frustration there, 
Rose, I'm going to call you Rosalind from now on so we don't confuse people at home. Oh, no, don't, don't say that. Yeah. That's when I'm in trouble with Rosalind. <laughs> Just stick with Rose. Okay. Um, you, could sense, you could sense the frustration on his face there, couldn't you? He, yeah, he didn't pretty, know how to get out of that. That's part of the beauty of Slalom is it feels so good when you get it right and then when it all falls apart, it's painful. And just the smallest of little mistakes can really be quite costly coming in as well. Yeah, absolutely. And especially here in Sayo, I think if you're the tiniest bit offline, it's quite hard to get it back on track. So the first of the Italians on the course, Paolo Cecon, and uh, the time set by Oliver Pujna was a 1.13, basically a 1.14. So that is uh, not going to be anywhere near the time you would think that... Uh, I mean, stranger things have happened. We've seen over the years, we've seen some really weird semi-finals and finals where everybody's got into trouble. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think today's that day. Yeah. We'll see some much faster times than I see one now. Yes, I don't think uh, Oliver Pushno, if he gets through in a real 114, it's not been a very good... And with, with all respect to Oliver, but uh, 114, if that's the best times for the men's, then uh, it's going to be a very interesting semi-final for sure. Yeah, I mean, Oliver will be looking towards securing the Olympic quota position in London. Um, that's kind of one of the main aims of the season, I guess, for a lot of nations. So we've still got time. So for the Olympic qualifications, uh, it's the top 15 nations in uh, K1, I think, top 13 in C1. You're a bit straight your shoulders <laughs> I should go, I'm going to get that information so that people know what I'm talking about. Um, a 102 there for, for uh, Prilo with an asterisk. So, But the, the important thing to remember in, uh, in London is that um, you can only qualify one per country. So, uh, for example, if Jess and Nomi Fox finish first and second, they only get the, first, they only get the one quota. And so sometimes countries way down. Uh, oh, there's an early touch, unfortunately, for Tristan. He's had a good season, Tristan Carter. He's got the locks flowing beautifully. Yeah, he's, he's definitely proud of his hair. Yep. Long flowing locks. Um, yep. Yeah, had a great race in Tartsen earlier in the year, made the final, which is pretty exciting. Um, Tristan's got flair on the water, so I hope he pulls, pulls together a good run here in Sayo. He's really worked hard at it, hasn't he? He's... Um takes as much pride in his uh, paddling as he does in his hair, which is a good thing because he does love that hair. It's a, it's a, it's a very Australian look, I have to say. Ross. The, the surfer look. It, well, when you've got that much good coastline. Is it the surfer look, though? Oh, Tristan, unfortunately, a bit of a touch. Not a bit of a touch, a big touch. He's got a nice boat as well. Do you know who designed his boat, Ross? So you'll see these Indigenous art in the green and gold, uh, the stickers, and Tristan's got big ones, but all of the team should have some little ones on their boats. Okay. Um, when you make the national senior team, oh, and under-23s and juniors as well, you get some stickers. And yeah, is, Pretty is, awesome. And is there a reason why they have the Indigenous stickers on? Yeah, so in Penrith, um, the team's been working pretty closely with a local group called Del Mari, um, and we do some team building stuff and, you know, like artwork all together, learning a bit about the culture, and yeah, it's really positive for the team. It looks great. It's pretty awesome, I think. Yeah, it's really, really good. Uh, I think he's confused about the 50, which may be fair enough. I didn't see which, which gate did you get the 50 on. You got a 50 on gate 14, Tristan did, so he looks a bit confused about mm, that. He did duck it. Yeah, anyway, it will be reviewed. They always review the 50, so uh, we'll see what the judges come up with. But even without that, uh, Ros, I think he's going to struggle a little bit because he had uh, a couple of other touches as well. So the first of uh, what is a very strong British contingent uh, is on the water, James Kettle. Yeah, strong paddler. Um, exciting to see the Brits here in Sayo, I think. They come here for training sometimes. They're pretty familiar with the course. But it is quite different to London, where their national program's based now. London's like big, chunky stoppers. Yeah, I was, I was mentioned earlier, I was in Paris at the Canoe Sprint 
uh, test event and I was walking along there watching some of the canoe sprint and I bumped into a couple of the Brazilian slalom paddlers and I said to them, well, you guys lost, shouldn't you be in Liceo? And they said, well, no, we're staying in Paris. We're training in Paris because uh, Liceo is such a different course to London. We wanted to train on a course that was more similar mm. to London. Which Interesting. Is, yes. I suspect they were lost. They're taking the wrong, <laughs> they're taking the wrong plane. But uh, anyway, they put a brave face on it. Good run here from James Kettle. Nice and clean. Oh. <laughs> they call that the commentator's curse, yeah, Ross. Yeah, you Yeah. Um, so, a touch there for James. The time at the moment, that uh, belongs to Poilo Cechon from Italy. It's a 102, so no one gone under the 100 yet. And as we get through this field of 30... Ah, uh, someone will get there, I'm sure. Absolutely, it'll be a 95, somewhere along the line, for sure. That's my prediction. Um, 95. I'm going to say... Go on. 94. 94. Well, we do have uh, Olympic medalists coming our way later on, so there will be a bit of pressure. And by the way, we've got uh, it's a bit of a side story here because uh, Alexander Slavkovsky, who will be on the water very, very soon, is having one last crack. Uh, after missing out on Tokyo, that was going to be it. Um, but he's having one last crack at trying to get onto an Olympic team. It's a sad Sad story, but at the same time, a reflection on how strong Slovakia is, isn't it, Ros? That somebody of Alexander Slavkovsky's standing has never been to the Olympics. Yeah, look, for decades, Slovakia dominated the C1 men with Michael Martikin, you know, multiple Olympic medalists. Matej Banush. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a tough one to crack, and it's just kind of pretty impressive to have so many great paddlers at that level. And uh, as Ros mentioned earlier on, this is uh, part of their selection, this race here in Maceo. So there'll be a bit of a side issue to watch in terms of which of the Slovakians do the best uh, this weekend. But let's watch this young man first of all. It is uh, Matej Marinic from Croatia. And again, um, nice and clean, but uh, not that quick on the water at this stage. Yeah, maybe... I does he train in Tartsen? I think the Croatians often train in Tartsen, so potentially a regular training site might not be accessible. Yeah, I'm not sure what, uh, what the facilities are like in Croatia, but, they're Cro but uh, they do come to Tartsen a lot. It's not far for them to, to come and train, but uh, he is putting together a nice clean run. Now he just needs to try and pick up a bit of speed down the bottom of the course, see if he can get around that 100 mark give himself a bit of a look in. He's going to be just over, just outside Chechon's time, I think. Just outside. Or just under. Wow, well done. Good finish. But I don't know that that's going to be good enough. He's got a bit of a wait now to see. Yeah, we have quite a few more paddlers to come. Yep. Jake Cochran uh, from Ireland. Spends a lot of time in the Pyrenees training. I think he's based in Poe, isn't he, Jake? Yep, lives in Poe now. Uh, Great to see him improving year by year. Committed. Ooh. Ooh. He's really throwing himself into this, isn't he? A lot of. You see the difference, Ros, in some of the paddlers. Some of them, you know, their, their upper body is just so still, and they just, you know, they let their arms do the work. Jake's, he just throws everything around, doesn't he? He's really putting everything into this. Yeah, I mean, there's different techniques. Sometimes if you're throwing your body around, it makes your boat move a lot. Other times you can really get the boat moving. Just by being still and smooth. Oh, goodness me. Panel beating job there for Jake later on. Get the nose of the uh, canoe checked out. Hope he's got uh, insurance. Yeah, look, with uh, scrutineering to check the size of the nose and tail and say it pays to check the ends between runs. Yes. So you can see he's really pinning the ears back, Jake Cochran, not leaving anything out there. Just really trying to, to, to nail a fast time. He's got that early touch, which he knows he's got. It was a very obvious one. So having to work hard now to... Oof. Jake was in Australia um, a few months ago in our summer for training, so hopefully he's had a good lead-in season. And it'll be about building through to the end of the year at Worlds. Just, oh yeah, not too bad, a little bit slow through there, but his time's blown out a bit unfortunately for Jake, so I doubt that we're going to see Jake 
in the final, but geez, worked hard. He really worked hard on that run. Yeah, and great to see him in the semi as well. He's a really lovely guy. You know, I think if anyone's going to come back the next day with a positive attitude, it's going to be Jake. Now, Timo Trummer, who had a good European Championships. And uh, the Germans, of course, always do very, very well. They've got a strong team across the men's and women's canoe and kayak programs. And uh, it's just a tough gig to try and get onto the team, first and foremost. Once you get on there, Ross is going to try and stay there. So Timo will be hoping to put together a good run today to, to show that he can mix it with the very, very best yeah, absolutely. Germany has such a strong history of great paddlers. It is tough to make the team. Um, you know, any paddler that's at a World Cup or a World Champs is going to be a good shot at making it to the final and, and beyond. So he's actually up on the split. The first paddler we've seen up on the split, which is a good result for him. We could have our first sub-100 time, maybe. Timo Trummer. I don't want to put the commentator's curse on him. Ooh. Um, <laughs> But he is holding it together quite nicely here. I'm not sure where Timo is. Timo in Augsburg or Mark Timo? I don't know, actually. Good commentators would know that, wouldn't they, Ross? Yeah, well, clearly not a good commentator here. <laughs> no, you and me, I'm talking about Augsburg. <laughs> I mean, Germany's pretty so lucky they have two such great quality venues. Yep. Yes, and we're in Augsburg earlier this year. We opened the season, in fact, in Augsburg. We had a wonderful World Championships there last year. It was so exciting. Oh, Timo. Oh, like a bucking bronco. <laughs> Timo Trummer there, back and forth, trying to get through that gate. Lost. Still going for it. Good on him. Yep. And look, he was ahead on the split, so you never know what's going to happen. So he's just over now, unfortunately. Just that one gate was going so well. Yeah, he, what the heck he goes. Let's watch this here, back and forth, like a bucking bronco he was. He... Look, I think you can take confidence that most of his run was really great. Yep. And yeah, this move down the down the bottom, it's taking a few people. Got a few victims so far. Nice. Daniel Perez, 21 years of age, on his local course. The Spanish, they didn't get any women through to the final, unfortunately, this afternoon. So can they get a couple of men through? to give the locals something to get. Oh, Daniel is a bit touched there with the front of the canoe, which will be a two-second penalty. Yeah, some exciting paddlers in the, in the Spanish Sea one then. I'm sure we'll see at least one in the final. That's my prediction. So do a lot of the paddlers spend the winter up here, Ross? In Sayo? Yes. I think it used to be Sayo was kind of a winter training camp option, but now everyone goes to Dubai or Australia yeah. or... Reunion. Yes. It'd be good to see. Um, La Reunion's turned out to be a really good popular place as well. In Dubai, of course. Not as, yeah. many, not as many in Australia this summer. Oh, I selfishly want everyone to go to Australia. Yes. It was once upon a time when every single slalom paddler in the world almost. Ooh, Daniel. Every slalom paddler in the world almost came down for the Australian summer. Yeah, I think we'll get there again. It kind of quietened down through, through COVID. That's going to build again, I think. Yes, just need to get those airfares down. That's the important thing. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have a word with you. Well, I've got to say, the Australian National Airline is copying some flack at the moment, so maybe they'll be shamed into uh, dropping airfare prices, airfares sooner. Yeah, but will they take kayaks? Do they? Do they not? Sometime. Did you pay? Maybe not 24 at once, one more time. Daniel Perez not happy, he probably thinks he could have gone a bit better. Oh, yeah, no, he's not happy. That's the man who's annoyed with his run and takes it out on the water. So Daniel Perez believes obviously he's not going to be in the mix now. We talked about Slovakia and the battle for Olympic selection. They've got to get the quota first, but uh, he was a young man who's been biding his time for years. Uh, Ros, he was sitting behind Mardikun, Banush and Slavkowski. That's a hard line-up to, <laughs> Just sit to and overtake. And everybody knew, I saw this guy at the under-23s and he was incredible. I thought, wow, this yeah. guy is so fast. He's a really great paddler. But we never saw him on the senior circuit and then we just, well, I could see why, because he had three of the best slalom paddlers 
canoe slalom paddlers in the world sitting in front of him. So Marty can not paddling, so that's opened an opportunity for him. Still got two pretty formidable blokes to, to knock off, though. But we know when he puts together a run, Ross, how, how fast he can be. So he's up early on this split, so maybe this will be our first sub-100 run. Yeah, he's looking great so far. Very smooth, very controlled. Um, I think sometimes when you've got those really great competitors to, to, to beat, you kind of know you've earned it when it happens. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, we know what he's capable of, and look at that. He's four, more than four seconds up now on the time set by Martic Marinesh from Croatia. I think Marinesh had the two-second penalty taken off, did he? So he's turning now, which is good for him, but he's still over. It's just 102 is his time. So there's a review, but this is going to go under the 100 well and truly. This is a very good run from Marco Mogorozzi. That's their new leader. Yeah, that was a quick one. Would have been faster if we switched them. You pass it on to him. <laughs> Tell him that. <laughs> what? I have not said that. <laughs> what are you doing, Louis Fernandez? Is that is that sun cream or is that cream? Shaving cream, maybe. Shaving cream. Original. I bet after that he thought, oh, that wasn't such a good idea. No, I bet he loves it. Might be getting a bit of stingy in the eyes. But anyway, Louis Fernandez is on the course. Looks like, I don't know if it was shaving cream, because he hasn't had a shave for a while, I don't think. Louis Fernandez, is he going to be the first Spaniard to really make his mark on this course this afternoon? Yeah, I think so. Looking good so far. So, a little bit down on the split. Down on the split, but it was a quick split that Mergorowski set, so... Uh, Mugarossi going well under, in fact, Mugarossi's now had a two-second penalty added to his time, but he's still un he's still sub-100, so he's at 98.5. So the judges did find that he had a touch. I wonder whether that would be crucial in the end, Ross. If you, if you and I are predicting 104s and 105s, 108 might be borderline. We'll see. So Louis Fernandez, without the shaving cream, is putting together a nice run here. You can sort of hear in the background there's a, a crowd, good healthy crowd here. A few whistles of support. Yep, cheering him on in the Spanish fashion. We've become accustomed. And now he's picked up some speed. He is under the split time. Luis Fernandez from Spain took an eternity to get over there, but he's still going okay. Yeah, he's. he's putting in a lot of effort for this bottom half. So we're wanting to go under 100 to be in the mix. He's going to do that, but how far under 100 is he? Good, good new race leader for Louis Fernandez. You probably can't believe it. <laughs> oh. Some happy ah. Oh, no. Probably while I was eating, I should have swallowed that before. <laughs> my arms up because now I've made myself look ridiculous. Uh, Zach Loken now, the big American. Also known as Buck. Also known as Buck. What a nickname. Also known as the silver medalist from Tucson. And wasn't that exciting? How thrilling was that? Yeah, to, absolutely. To see Buck Loken, of course, seventh in the Tokyo Olympics. And just a genuine all-around good guy. Absolutely, yeah. He's always good value. Nice to have a chat. Very happy. And of course, the Loken family strongly involved in the sport. They work so hard and they do so much for the sport. And um, we know how passionate they are about building the sport in the United States. And we've got some exciting events coming up there in the years to come, which I'm super excited about. And super excited that we might have an announcement very, very soon on Slalom and the Los Angeles Olympics. Stay tuned for a possible announcement in that area very soon. Oh, come on, Russ, you've got to give us more I than that. I can say no more than that. I've been sworn to secrecy, but I'm hoping we can have an announcement very soon. You know, once you say there's a secret, you have to tell what secret well, you know, is. because then it's not a secret. Do you understand what a secret is? <laughs> I think you missed the concept of what a secret is, Ross <laughs> Lawrence. Maybe over a beer tonight, I'll, uh, I'll whisper in your shell like you. No, not me. I want you to tell everybody. If you tell me tonight, then I can tell everybody tonight. Yeah, that's good, because nobody will know where it's come from then. Zach's putting in a good... Oh, oh. I said commentators curse. Shut up, Ross. Just shut up. Don't say anything. Uh, he was going so well. He's still putting in a good run, though, but oh, it's going to be close. I think he's going to be just over the 100. 
for Zach Loken. Yeah, disappointment. It was going well up until that touch. So that's put him into third at the moment. Uh, it's so hard when you cross the finish line. Everybody is watching, and it's such an emotional time. Yep. Roberto Colzingari. Also known as a beanie model. Is he known as a beanie model? No, I just made that up because he's wearing a beanie. And you have to say, why is he wearing a beanie when it's like 28 degrees? Wow. Because he's a beanie model. Yeah. And I think that's right. Well done, Ros. Um, maybe it's a good luck beanie. Maybe it is. Maybe that was filmed earlier this year. I can't think where we were earlier this year where it was particularly cold, though. But uh, anyway, he looked good. He was rocking that beanie. But no beanie today. He's got the helmet on. He's out there. He is trying to set himself a time in the mid-90s if he can. He certainly wants to go under 100 to challenge for a position in this afternoon's final. And so far, so good for the man from Italy. He does a lot of training in Tucson. Always goes very, very well, in fact, on the course in, in Tucson. But uh, would like to be able to put in a good result here as well in, uh, in Spain. So. Oh, he's super tight in that up. Kept control really well in the cross between the ups. He's a pretty exciting paddler to watch for Berto. It's going nicely through here as well. So uh, with the split time, yeah, he's, uh, he's going to be thereabouts, I think. So just needs to hold it together for the bottom part of the course. Rui Fernandez, the Spaniard. He's sitting there on the top of the leaderboard at the moment with a 98.45. Roberto Colasingari. Crossbow spin. Mm. It's going to be around the 100, I think, for Roberto. Just, uh, just under. Ooh, I don't know. We've got a few more paddlers to go. Yeah. No, I think uh, that's the look of a man who's not quite sure. Now, Brody Crawford, uh, who sat in that seat where you are, Ros, yeah, many times this season. To fill. I know. He loves the commentary, but I said to him today, I said, mate, what's gone wrong? You've just done one run. <laughs> because, because normally he does a couple of runs. Uh, but got through on the first run and was looking good. I think yeah. the break back in Australia, I think, uh, did him well. He spent four or five weeks there, I think. So uh, it did him well. Yeah, and I think that kind of shows it's good to reset, good to be home. And, you know, we talk, Ross, about uh, sacrifices people make, and Brody's uplifted his life. He was, he's a Perth boy, of course, but uh, he's relocated over to the other side of Australia to try and focus on his, on his paddling career, and uh, just a genuinely nice guy, one of the nice people on the, on the tour, and uh, just really love to see him doing well. Yeah, absolutely. He's keen. He's at uni and, yeah, moved over from Western Australia. He comes from Perth. There's a couple of great kayaking clubs over there. Um, but the best white water is at Penrith, really. So he made the move. Somebody asked me today how many kilometres between <laughs> Sydney and Perth, and it's a bit over 3,000, I think. Yeah, it's a five-hour flight from, uh, from Sydney to Perth. Yeah, it's it's, it's the same width, I think, as the United States. Mm. Just to give you an idea. 40 hours of driving, Google Maps told me. Yeah, it is a long way, especially when you've got a canoe strapped to your roof and you get to the other end and there's no water in the canoe. Uh, but Brody's um, had a touch and there's a review on gate 18, so and his time's blown out a little bit, unfortunately, for Brody Crawford. So there'll be no final there for the big man. Oh, that's a shame. Am I going to have to fight him for commentator duties? Ooh, not if he, can, not if he swears like that. Not if anywhere near. Oh, do you know what? If I ever swore during a race, my mum would message me about it. Would she? Yeah. You she, swear, and you swear say, a lot too. I do not. Like yes, it. you do. I remember. I used to work for Paddle Australia, Ros. I used to hear your potty mouth sometimes. <laughs> um, but you'd swear for good reasons as well as bad ones, I swear. Yuri uh, Priskovic, how about, how about this young man? I know, it's incredible. Just kind of decided to do C1 and is one of the best in the world. Well, he's currently sitting fourth on the overall standings in the World Cup, uh, which is unbelievable. After three World Cups, he had that unbelievable third at his first World Cup ever uh, in Augsburg, and then he followed up with a ninth. So he had two top ten finishes 
in the, in the in his first two World Cups and has just been going very well. And then he went to um, the European Championships and finished fourth. It's a little bit reminiscent of uh, Fabien Lefebvre, who picked up C1 and shortly thereafter won the World Championships. And I think there were a lot of very unimpressed C1 medalists. <laughs> well, I know that, I mean, the Czech team is so tight knit, but I, I know that a couple of the, the C1 paddlers in the Czech team just thought, seriously, come on, give us a break. Um, but it's good. I mean, we were talking before, Ros, about how it inspires other people on the team to work harder and to to really just try and lift themselves. When you have a newbie come in and, and threaten your position, then uh, it's going to inspire others to work just as hard, if not harder, than, than what Yuri Priska, because then look at that. Goodness me. Oh, he's got himself in some trouble here, though. Yeah, he's lost quite a bit of time in a few different places. But you see, he takes some pretty aggressive tight lines, and I think there's a lot to be transferred between classes. So what makes Yuri good in K1 also can be a strength in C1. Um, and you notice him switching, which I think a lot of the doublers do. Yeah, he's got that look of a guy who's still, you know, any result's a good result for you in C1. Now, Alexander Stavkovsky, let me just quickly read you through his resume. He's a four-time World Championship silver medalist, the latest times in 2022 and 2021. He's a three-time European champion. He earned his first ever podium at a World Cup on this very course back in 2004. That's not long ago. He won a bronze medal, so almost 20 years ago. Yeah, wow. And he's never been to an Olympics. And to me, I just think, wow, how could a guy of that quality, that calibre, never get to an Olympics? And he's really having one last crack at it this year. And he's just such a genuinely nice guy. Uh, I mean, all the Slovakians, besides Mikhail Martikin, he, he and Metaj Banush and Mergorovsky, they're tall. They're very tall paddlers, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Mikhail Martikin's not tall by any measure, but... Uh, he still managed to get that boat moving. He still managed to win a couple of Olympic golds. So Alexander Slavkovsky out there on the course wants to get through to the final. There is that that battle on the Slovakian team for Olympic selection, and all results are very important. And at the moment, well, it's uh, Marko Mergorovsky sitting there in second position at the moment. So Slavkovsky really needs to be neat, he needs to be tidy, and he needs to be fast. I mean, that goes for everybody, but... Uh, First Lukoski to get through. He's well down the line. He's obviously lost a bit of speed somewhere along this course, Ros. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's pretty tough out there. Some of these moves, you just make the slightest error and you lose quite a bit of time. So I think, unfortunately, it's going to be just over the 100 for Alexander Slavkovsky. Puts him into fourth. Oh, I don't know. That's going to be... There's Jess Fox doing what Jess Fox does, signing autographs. Being friendly, making friends. Making friends. Heart of gold. Yep. Absolutely wonderful role model for the sport. Now, Joris Otten is on the course from the Netherlands. And, uh, well, we haven't seen a lot of him this year. But, ooh. Oh, Contatus curse. Oh. People are going to... People... Athletes are going to get really annoyed with me if they're not already Ross. I'm going to start keeping a tally. That they, I start talking people up and then things go wrong. But um, young man from the Netherlands, it would be good to see the Dutch at the Olympics, wouldn't it? Representing, of course, Martina Beckman there for the women. But it would be great to see the Dutch uh, put together a team and, and uh, be there in force in Paris. Yeah, absolutely. Joris is based in Po. And the touch there, unfortunately. So two touches. Tell you what, Ros, you and I ambitiously said that there'd be 105s and 104s. Nobody's going anywhere near those times at this stage. There's, there's, still, there's still time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. I'm confident. Confident it will happen. Uh, at the moment, the quickest time is uh, a 98.45 for Fernandez. But we do have some world champions and Olympic champions still to come. So there's quality still sitting in the sheds. Here at the sound. Absolutely. Oh, that gate's getting a few people. You got a 50. I thought that was tight. I didn't want to call it, but uh, 50 seconds. They are reviewing it. It was touch and go. It's one of those ones that Ros was talking about earlier on where you 
you've just got to make the judgment about whether the whole head was through and some of the boat. Yeah, and this angle that we get on this camera, it's a little bit hard to tell because you're looking from the side, whereas really you need to be looking from downstream or upstream to nope. see the Ooh, whole No, he in. doesn't like it. He not, I've never seen anyone, though, come in and say, yeah, good call. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks for that 50. Spot on. <laughs> I think there's kind of there's two different attitudes when it comes to penalties. There's either there's people who just never believe that they got that penalty, and I kind of admire the confidence. Mm. And then there's other people who own it. Yeah, I've got to say though, some people they do get a bit too feisty when it's obvious to everybody there was a 50. Just just wear it, just take it, go ahead and do better next time. Liam Jagu from uh, from Ireland, uh, based in Poe. And a couple of good results. I always remember, I think it was, I always call it the Pandemic World Cup, uh, which we had in Poe. Remember that year, Ross? We only had two World Cups that year. One was in Tussin and one was in Poe. And they were the weirdest events that I've ever been to. Just I just, I try and forget most of that year, oh, to be honest. It was bizarre. The testing we had to do, the rules that were in place. They, if anybody came in with a slight sniffle, we shut the whole thing down. Um, but Liam, I think from memory, I think he won gold in Poe. If not gold, he certainly won a medal at the World Cup in Poe, but of course it is his home venue. Yeah, he was a really great paddler. Yep. I think there's still more to see from Liam. It's quite an international crowd training in Poe. I've lost count of how many paddlers we said, oh, they're based in Poe. Yep. It's such a good training venue and there's great training partners, coaching available. Canada, for example, kind of have their national program based there. Yeah, and all of the Australians are based there as well, aren't they? They spend a lot of time there during the European summer. Yeah, usually camps. And, you know, there's something to be said for the great quality baked goods you can get there as well. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. So, Liam Jagu coming in now. He's going to be outside the sub 100 time as well. So, at the moment, we're looking here at. Uh, only three paddlers have gone under the 100, which is uh, surprising, but we are heading towards the top 10, so we're going to start seeing some big-name paddlers on the course very soon. Here we are, not the uh, Germans. Lennart Tuschra is strutting his stuff on the water. It's a very aggressive paddling style. He's definitely got the power to get there. Nice and clean so far, and under the split, which was set by the Spaniard Fernandez. So very soon, uh, Louis Fernandez will learn if he's going to be back in action for the finals. He can start ringing around, getting the fan club down here this afternoon to watch the action. Most of them will be down here with their paddling here in sail. Yeah, it's always such a great atmosphere. Good crowds running down the bank for the finals. Usually, it's one of the one of the good racing venues for great atmosphere. You and I are both, we're way too young, Ross, to remember what it was like in 1992. But I can imagine this being an Olympic venue. Being a long way from Barcelona, but what the atmosphere must have been like, and the celebration with the sport being back in the Olympics, you know, it was there in 1972, and then that was it for 20 years. And then finally, back on the program here in, uh, in 1992, you just, you know, you look up there in the background now, the stands, and that would be packed with people. It's, oh, Leonard Dodds are 50, I think. No idea. No, gone deep there as well. So that's, you know, what a, forget about that gate. That was an absolute mess. I think he hit both poles and then maybe missed them anyway. So not a great uh, way to finish off that run, unfortunately, for Leonard. Took a bit of a risk, it didn't quite pay off, no. but sometimes, you know, that's all part of the learning process, so you can do it. Do it next time. Now the Frenchman, who's had a very, very good year. He's been one of the surprise packets, in fact, of the men's C1 this year. He's only been, I think he was only in the two World Cups, the first two, and he was top ten in both. I think he was sixth in Augsburg and seventh in uh, Prague, so really came out and... Um, blew everyone away early on so fantastic to see that uh, and of course such hot competition for positions on the French team and Lucas Rosian has been fast this year very very fast yeah if you look at the way he paddles he's really great at keeping the boat light and on top of the water which definitely helps 
with speed. Um, but yeah, you know anyone that's made it through French selection is going to be doing very good runs at the World Cups. So we've got, uh, I think, 12 paddlers to go. And it will be, so two more, and then we're going to start counting down our top 10 and learning the makeup of our final. And Royston is putting down a time that's going to challenge the leader. He's under the split set by Louis Fernandez. So we could have, if he holds this together, a new race leader, which will make everybody else sitting in the sheds to stand up and take notice. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, obviously a great paddler, but there's also a little French advantage in that they're not too far from Sayer, and they, they often even race one of their selection races in Sayer each year. So we love plenty of experience on this course. Um, just putting that to good use here because he is well and truly in a good position here. He can nail this final gate, which he does. He's going to go under 100. The question is how far under? Far enough to go into the lead. New race leader. New Bit race leader. A double leader. take at the yes. time at the end there. Wasn't, uh, well, that's there. That's the reaction from the Spanish fans who've just seen their bloke knock off the top of the leaderboard. Ryan Wesley. <laughs> I love watching these little vignettes of people at the beginning because I only got to do it once one year before I retired. I had no idea what to do. What did you do? Uh, something embarrassing. Was it? We have to go and dig that out. We're going to dig that out when we introduce you later on. Uh, as our commentator, we can perhaps replay it. That's a terrible idea. I think it's a great idea. Some, of, some athletes have done it two or three times because they did it and they've come up with a new idea. Something they thought of and they think, oh, I'm going to do that instead. So they're going in and saying, can I reshoot it, please? Because I want to rub shaving cream all over my face. And... <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, you know, athletes are all about improvement and uh, doing things better. Yep. And if it gives everyone a laugh, well, why not? Mm -hmm. So Ryan Wesley is on the course. He's um, been battling a bit of injury, um, but uh, looks to be paddling pretty well at the moment. Uh, I think from memory. So in Tuxen, he injured himself in training, I think, and went back, left early to go back to GB. And, uh, He's done well to get back on the water now. Yep. Yep. He's in touch for the first... Yeah, but uh, looks to be in control still, which is so he's just over a second outside the time of Royston, which is a 97.27. So we're just nice there. So he's, he's looking around a 99 maybe for Ryan Wesley. He'll go under the 100. Ooh, that's going to be tight. That's going to be very tight because we are now into the top 10. So it's very, very interesting times now because we've got uh, a couple of Frenchmen to come, a couple of Czechs as well, and a couple of Slovenians. We've got some very, very good paddlers to come. So let's wait and see now, folks. Every run now will determine who is in the final. And Nicolas Guest from France. He's wearing the number four bib for a reason because he had a really good season last year. He's had a couple of good runs this year as well. But we haven't seen the best of him by any shot this year. So let's see if he can uh, put something together here in the so Again, another very tall athlete, I guess, but uh, always looks, I think, so smooth when he's on the water, doesn't he? Yeah, if you look at that, like he's, his boat's always flat, it's always moving fast, and he's not kind of throwing his body around too much. Definitely an exciting paddler to watch. Um, one of those ones who kind of makes it look almost effortless. So we're in the situation now, no matter what Nicola does, we're going to have a Frenchman in the final. Uh, it doesn't matter what he does, because at the moment, the man sitting at the top of the leaderboard is his teammate, Royzen. So he can either knock him off and go straight into the final, or he will finish below him, and in that case, Royzen will go in. So we will have a Frenchman in the final. It's just a question of who will it be at this stage, because Geston's time is under the split of Royzen. So he's putting together a good run here. Yeah, he's really nailed all of the key moves. He's looking calm and in control. 
We may have more than one French ring in the final half. Yeah, we're scheduling suspicion because it's time to be around at number six, which is pretty good. And we have a new race leader and we have a man straight into the final. Nicola Gestin from France. Congratulations. He's trying to keep a lid on things, but... Mm -hmm. It's always a good feeling when you cross that finish line and you don't have to wait to find out yeah, what's going to happen. See the queue up on side your name and be pretty happy with yourself. Uh, another who has paddled well under the pressure of having Yuri Priskovic on this somebody uh, who also enjoyed filming the, uh, the pre-race nuptials. Uh, Vaclav Chalupka, who has had two, I think, two World Cups this year. He's been top ten in both. In fact, he finished fifth in... Augsburg and then sixth in Prague. He recently was in the European Championships and finished third. So he's had a pretty consistent season. Chalupka and uh, he'd been looking to get through to the final, especially now that uh, Yuri Priskovic is out of the top ten. So a chance for somebody to step out of that shadow. Yeah, and they know how to race under pressure, the Czechs. They've got such tight competition within them and they have such great races in Prague, especially with the crowds and all sorts of noise to deal with. They're pretty impressive races and paddlers all around. Two second penalty for a gate touch on gate five for Chalupka and uh, interestingly in the top ten at the moment there's only two paddlers who have a gate touch so I don't know what that tells us was about um, It pays to be clean. Yes, That's what it tells us. It certainly does. So Chalupka now is over the time set by Royston and he has a review as well so maybe this is just slipping away a little bit from the check. That's a nice move, wasn't it? A little bit lower to the other. Yeah, yeah. Maybe See. that's the price you pay for that move, isn't it? <laughs> the walls here in Sayo have the boulders embedded in the cement and you would have seen that club do a punt there where you push on the paddle in the upstream. It's a little bit hard here because there's so many rocks in the way. So we have two Frenchmen in the final already. Because Lucas Royson has just joined Nicola Guest in the final. They are the first two paddlers through. And now Rafi Avaldi is on the course. He was fourth in Prague. And he's done a couple of really good heat runs this year. He just struggled to transfer that pace and that speed into semi-finals and finals. So maybe today could be the day. Yeah, he's looking very confident so far. Such, gets such power out of each stroke. That's really helpful here in Sayo. Really good top part of the course now for Rafi Avaldi from Italy. Sitting on the cusp at the moment, well, the Spanish fans will be cheering on not Rafi Avaldi because, uh, that was really good, because uh, it is their man, Luis Fernandez, at the moment, who is sitting there in prime position at the moment with a 98.45 for Luis Fernandez. Oh, he's moving nicely though, isn't he? Yeah, he's looking good so far. Still plenty of gates to go. Yep. So Raffaello, Raffaello Avaldi is really smooth at the moment, just like a well-oiled machine here, slipping down the course. That was a pretty beautiful stagger. Still up on the split. The kids getting excited in the background. Is it going to be on the telly? And they were on the telly. <laughs> Still really holding it together. This is a nice run. We are going to go. Here's, here's the 94 you were talking about, Ros. It's going to be 95, close to my prediction, I think. Yes. Uh, you've got it. There's still time there. There is time. I but can feel the 94 coming. There. And look at that. He's just waiting that for was. everybody to acknowledge what a great run that was. Very impressive run. 95 seconds. Whoop just banged himself on the head by accident, but doesn't matter because he's through to the final. He is the fastest man on the course at the moment. Raffaello Avaldi from Italy. So Gregor Hedwig now. Been around for a while, been to a couple of Olympic Games. Uh, it's always been just thereabouts, Ros. We've never really seen him stand up and take this sport by the by the ears and say, this is my sport, this is what I'm going to dominate. He's, he's very consistent, but we just want him to stand up one day. Oh. 
went for the sweep up on gate seven. That's exciting. Yep. A little less common to see that technique in the C1. So Gregor Hedwig from Poland looking to knock Louis Fernandez out of the final at this stage. Fernandez still waiting, waiting patiently to see if he will be through. And at this stage, the time is, well, is it's very close at the moment between Hedwig and Fernandez. Fernandez is sitting in fourth position at the moment. We have three into the final already. And we're waiting to build the last seven places. The Spanish will be watching this one closely. They like a good home paddler in the final. Ooh, be terrible if we have another final without a Spaniard in it. But still got another one to come. Mikael Trave, who had paddled very well in both the C1 and the K1 to, so far this weekend. One of those rare men who do both. So we'll yeah, see. it's a very interesting paddler to watch as well. Really yeah. exciting. Still a young man. But uh, Gregor Hedwig, I think he's going to be close. No, he's just going to be just outside, unfortunately, for Gregor. Oh, there'll be a, a cheer from the Spanish crowd and a little bit of a groan from the Polish. Yep, it? the Spanish have their man. They have the first man into the final. Louis Fernandez is there. He will be competing for gold later on this afternoon. Could we end up with three Frenchmen in the final? Jules Bernadette. Uh, won a world title in Krakow at the Juniors and Under-23 under World Championships. And he's, I think it was his first Under-23 World Championships, or certainly his first world title in the Under-23. So he's pretty happy to finish in his final season in the Under-23s with a title. And now we're going to see if he can make it through to the finals here. It just underlines, Ross, how tough competition is on the French team, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And they're all capable of making the final, and people who aren't on the team are capable of making a final. It's, they've got such great depth. Oh, oh, that's not the way he wanted to go. Oh, he's recovered okay, but just lost. I mean, in this... Oh, no, there's a touch. No, this is unfortunately... Stay positive, Jules, stay positive. But you can see there, you can sort of see his body language. Not happy with the way this has turned out for Jules Bernadette, which will be good for Marco Mergorozzi from Slovakia. Because he may be about to go through to the final with a two-second touch, but he is the man sitting on the bubble at the moment. He's sitting there waiting to see if he will be in. And uh, you would think that unless he can sprout wings here, <laughs> Jules, oh, no, nope, here we go. Another touch as well. So that is it. That's the race for Jules Bernadette. Unfortunately, the Frenchman is quite a bit low there as well. So, unfortunately, just slipping away from him, we'll only have two Frenchmen in the final. Two, two will probably do. Yes. Can't be greedy. <laughs> Cannot be greedy. Now, this could be a 94 second man. Yeah. My mind is on He's One. A, such an incredible paddler. He's been on the scene for a really long time. He's got the experience and the composure where he delivers a run when it counts most. And you know, Ross, there's, it, there's something special about sport when nice people do well. <laughs> Everybody's nice and slow. Everyone is nice and slow, but Benny is... He is very nice. If you have a look at the footage, go back and look at the footage of the cleanup that's happening at Tux and, and Guy, one of the guys doing a lot of the heavy lifting was Benjamin Savsek. He was there, he turned up straight after the day after, moving stuff, lifting stuff, just doing whatever he could to try and get that white water centre there back. Oh, just ran into a little bit of a trou trouble there, but... It's kept going, that's okay. Yep. It doesn't need to define his run. Nope. He is the reigning Olympic champion, of course, Benny Savsek. Such a good run in Tokyo. Just so disappointed that there wasn't a crowd there to witness just how special that run was. But uh, mm, what a funny Olympics! Oh, hilarious! It's so tough, it's such tough going for everybody. Oh, and it's such a was it a touch? Did you brush that or not? Clear, I'm gonna say, okay. But you just you've already admitted on this commentary that you can't see gate touches. So. Yeah. We'll see. But, oh, he's two seconds down, so we're waiting for Ryan Wesley now. He's got... Oh, oh 
no, 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 no. And he's missed the next gate as well. This is a disaster. Oh. Oh, Benny Savasek, that has not... He's gone... He's going back up. They've given him a 50, but he's going back up to do this gate. Good, 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 good. Always, always go back for the gate, I say. That just shows the professionalism of this man and that, yes. you know, you've still got to finish the course properly. You don't want a 50 next to your name. Not the run that he wants to see, but... Wow. Well, this has thrown this event wide open, folks, because I think... Look at that. Oh, Benny. No, look at that. Definitely would have been a 50. He's had to go back and do it again, um, and that has ruled him out of the final, and it has thrown this men's C1, because I think Ross... He would have he would have been favourite for sure. Yeah, always one to watch out for in the top three. So it means that Adam Burgess, who had finished top ten at the last two World Cups, eighth in uh, Prague, and then he had a fifth in Tussen. So his season has got better every time he's got on the water. And now he's looking because Ryan Wesley is through to the final after the run of. Benny Savsek. So now we're waiting to see whether Roberto Colasingari will get through. Adam's looking pretty smooth and in control. A little bit down in the splits. Did you know he's a bit of a yoga and breathing technique expert? I, I do know that. And I know that because during COVID, uh, when we were trying to find things to keep people entertained at home and keep them active, Adam, that's where he came to the fore. He stepped up because he was doing a lot of online yoga classes and stuff like that, and people were lapping him up. It's mm. pretty good, good psychic. Are you a yoga? Are you, are you in northern New South Wales, which for people living uh, not from Australia, that's where a lot of yoga type people live. Okay. <laughs> what do you mean by a yoga type person? You know what I mean. <laughs> people who like the finer things in life that nature brings. Yeah, look, I, I go to yoga classes. Adam Burgess is going to be. He's through. Yes, he is. He yeah, is through. He's got a first seven qualified. Wow. Well done, Adam two Burgess. Brits. Two Brits, two Frenchmen at this stage. We've done Roberto Collins in green on the bubble. He's on the bubble, and just behind him is Alexander Slavkovsky. And here is the man, Matej Benouche, who could make life very difficult in terms of the Olympic dreams of his teammate Alexander Slavkovsky. You know who I wouldn't want to be coming down the course if I was sitting in the bubble? Matej Benush? Yeah. He's a pretty formidable competitor. He is formidable. Ooh, if you, I've what, taken over the commentator's curse. Yeah, first. why hit a gate once when you can hit it twice just to make sure the judges didn't miss it? Um, two seconds, but he could still, he could absorb that. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that needs to define the run for him. And the best competitors are always bouncing back from small mistakes. Yep. So Benouche now has got some work to do. He wants to stay in the mix, not just to make the final, but stay in the mix for that all-important selection points for the Slovakian... Uh, Slovakian. Uh, yes, the Slovakian team. And, ooh, just look to lose a little bit of traction there but he's back on track again here but he's down well on the split time so needs Ross to do something pretty special here yeah anything's possible who knows uh, I don't know if you've noticed that Marte has got like the world's biggest tea grip the top hand in C1 that, that he's hanging on to bigger yeah. than any other competitor I've seen why do you think that is what, mm -hmm. did, what advantage would that give you just the right size for his hand I guess big hands big grip He's going to be okay, I think. He's going to be through. Let's have a look at the time. It's always oh, going to be tight. Oh, no. Seventh. He's in. He's in just. That's a pretty good comeback on the bottom half there. Oh, Matej Benouge has made life difficult for Alexander Slavkovsky, who is now sitting 10th. We have two positions to go. And the Spaniards now will be getting behind Mikel Trave, just 23 years of age, one of the few men, one of the only men who does both the K1 and the C1. He loves this course. He does it very well. Does he ever? Uh, I don't know if I was Roberto Colasingari and Alexander Stavkovsky that I'd be relying on this guy to make big mistakes. But we shall see. 
World Cup semi-finals can be funny places. Absolutely. So at the moment we have there's an asterisk next to Banusha's name. I'm not sure if that's if they're looking at the two second penalty he caught, but that, that was a definite two yeah, second. It's pretty clear, I would say. Yeah. So maybe there's something else that they spotted, or are they checking out that two second wasn't a fifty? I think he was fine. I think he went inside the, that gate. Maybe there was another gate there that was problematic, but we'll keep you updated. Trave on a fairly solid run so far. So looking good, Mikel Trave. He was the fastest, second fastest qualifier in the heats yesterday. And is putting together a good run here. We already have one Spaniard in the final. And listen to that crowd, folks. They are getting behind their man. Yeah, he's in front of the, the, the good spot to sit and watch the big screen is right about here. And he's up now on the split. So at the top of the leaderboard, it is Rafi Valdi who has the fastest time. Trave. Looking to go around the 95, 96. He really hasn't let it up, has he? Nope. Hammering it the whole way down. Here comes a 95 as well. Another 95 time. Not, and a new... Whoa, look at that. Look at that. Gives the home crowd something to get excited about. So excited, I'm going to take my shirt off. <laughs> That's how excited I am about uh, that run there from Mikhail Trave. It's good to Ooh. see him finishing the final. So, unfortunately for Alexander Slavkovsky, that's going to make life difficult because he is now out of the mix. So now it's Luka Bozic v Roberto Kolozingari. And Luka Bozic is in very good form. He comes off winning form in uh, Tucson. Won the uh, World Cup gold medal there in front of his home crowd. He was pretty excited about it too. So can he carry that form? into today's race. He's looking at going well. Let's have a look at Collins and Gary's time. The time he wants to beat to be in the final, he's got to go under 100, basically, because Collins and Gary's time was a 99.56. So far, Ros, all top 10. Paddlers are under 100. But then from then on, they're all over the 100, so... Yeah, Lucas looking pretty crisp so far. Yep. I think he's definitely got it in him under 100. I'm still waiting for someone to hit that 94. Well, I was Maybe about for the say, final. I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to embarrass you, but your prediction of 94, I predicted 95. We've got two guys doing 95, no guys doing 94. I know it's not a competition, but just saying. <laughs> Look, it's good to be just, you know, looking ahead a little bit. Yep, but we are seeing. Always aiming for faster. Now, Luka Bosic could go to 90. No, he's not going to go. He's definitely not going to go 94, but. Uh, He's probably going to go under 100 the way he's going. As I mentioned, he's got a couple of seconds to play with to get him in that top 10. Roberto Collins and Gary is the man sitting in 10th position at the moment. Very solid in that last move there. I think he's going to be okay. He'll be around a 98, I think, here, which will be okay for yeah, 98.7. That's going to be safe. That is safe for Luka Bozic. Will not. Yep, job done. Job done. Top 10 finalised. And a good-looking final, too, I think. Mikel Trave. Is, huh, Mikel Trave is the fastest qualifier at 95.27. No pressure. Rafael Avaldi. So our top ten is Trave from Spain, Avaldi from Italy, Gestin from France, Roizen from France, Fernandez from Spain. There we go. Confirmation there. Mergorossi from Slovakia, Bozic. Burgess, Manouche, and Wesley. Gee, that's, that is a tough final to call. There's a lot of national doubles in there. It really, really is. It's uh, exciting. Some big names missing out. Uh, Zach Loken, of course, silver last time round. No bigger name though than Benny Savasek. Look at that down there in 29th position. Mm, that reset. Yuri Priskovic missing as well, but uh, this is he's a K1 paddler. So he's, a he's always got another class. Yes, he has. It wouldn't be as exciting if nobody sure. missed out. Okay. Uh, oh, look at that. That's a big yawn. This is the Spanish. You see, that's what happens if you sit up till midnight. Oh, they should have had siesta by now. They should have done. Tristan Carter, not happy with the way things went. Yeah, all round. Look, uh, really interesting. What do you take away from this afternoon? What do you take away from this course? Rose. Uh, look, 
definitely staying clean and so it seems to make a big difference. A um, couple of key moves the last three or four gates. There's a few blowouts there, so those people that have kept it together all the way to the bottom have done well. Yep, it's set the scene for what should be some great finals. We will be bringing them to you live. I hope you can join us. My name's Ross Solly. With me in the commentary box has been Ros Lowen. It's been a great pleasure to bring you the semi-finals. Join us again very, very soon for finals action from Maceo in Spain. Over and out.